So very good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Asylum Workshop, Global Asylum Governance and the EU's role in te offering temporary protection in, to people fleeing war in Ukraine. We are web streaming live from so, Turkey. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hearing myself. In offering temporary this is because we're web streaming to YouTube. We are web streaming live from Hello? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so now we can start, um, restart or recontinue. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, we, we, we are very glad and very grateful to be here in uh, Antalya in Turkey um, in a two-day event uh, within the scope of the Asylum Project. And today's session is web streamed, is public. Um, this will be available um, after today in our website. And um, I would like to express our gratitude uh, in the Asal, the Asal Consortium's gratitude to Melte Minelli, um, Suleiman, the Middle University, who has organized actually this event in close cooperation with the SEPS team. Thank you, Melte, once more for bringing us together in this beautiful place. This is a very special moment for us because it's the first um, in-person hybrid meeting that we organize in Asal. During the last couple of years, we've been meeting quite regularly, online mainly. Some of you may have been following our webinars. Uh, we've been having a few uh, of those. Um, and today is quite unique, as I said, because we are learning yeah. here in person from colleagues in Turkey, Turkish scholars, uh, together with some ASAL consortium uh, partners who have made it uh, to Turkey uh, to learn together, to discuss together some of the findings of the project and uh, some of the also experiences in this country uh, with the temporary protection to Syrian nationals. Uh, we will uh, go in depth today on these matters. Uh, today's agenda is divided in two panels. We will start uh, with the first one that I'm chairing <clears throat> on European uh, responses to forced displacement from Ukraine and the activation of the, the temporary protection directive. And then after the break, we will have one really dedicated to lessons learned from Turkey. The Asal project pays particular attention to this. Uh, lessons learned from other countries which are facing very similar uh, challenges and um, dilemmas uh, than those experienced also in the European Union by some member countries as well. So <clears throat> yes, the triggering of the temporary protection directive is very positive, very welcoming uh, step, um, really coordinated EU action uh, 20 member states together unanimously deciding to provide temporary protection to people uh, fleeing war uh, from Ukraine. It was really unanimously decided uh, by all of them. This is quite historic and particularly relevant in light of the critical juncture uh, uh, in the region in respect of Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. But also in Asyl, you know, we engage academically with some of the <clears throat> underlying issues and questions that EU responses raise, particularly when one compares the EU response um, with uh, previous or still ongoing conflicts um, around the world, for example, in Syria or in Afghanistan, the current situation in Afghanistan or in Libya, there is a stark really difference um, in the kind of responses that we've witnessed. And um, in Asyl, you know, we are very, uh, you know, aware of the need of a project of this nature to adapt to new developments. So we, together with Melton, Ineli, and some colleagues, we decided to launch a new forum that you can find on our website, the Asyl Project website, dedicated to critically thinking about the questions and issues raised by the EU response. Uh, it starts with a kickoff paper that we co-authored together with uh, Leisa Brumat, Lina Bosiolute, and Melte Manai. This is the kickoff piece. 
And then colleagues from the network and other external scholars have also um, provided inputs from other EU member states like Poland, Hungary, the UK, <clears throat> about how they see the implementation of the directive. Now, what you will find there is a lot of open conversation. This will be open until June, an open uh, academic conversation on several issues about the scope of temporary protection, about elements related to discrimination. You know, there's been evidence of uh, differential discriminatory treatment of some people fleeing Ukraine based on uh, ethnic racial um, grounds, which are prohibited in international and European law when these people actually arrive at the border or at times of having access to social assistance, but also the scope of the temporary protection uh, decision as adopted by member states in contrast to the commission's proposal. The commission proposal included a larger personal scope of beneficiaries because member states, some member states, in particular Polish governments, but also others, call for restricting the personal scope and offering wide discretion to national governments as to whether to offer or not temporary protection to third country nationals living in Ukraine, including long-term residents. So this raises, of course, issues of discrimination as well. And also there's been a lot of conversation about Europeanness and European identity, that the kind of response that the EU has given is because we share a sort of Europeanness with the people in Ukraine, that of course there is something that we do share, absolutely, but it may also become exclusionary, an exclusionary understanding of what qualifies as European and not, and what is a European identity that is not inclusionary on diversity, questions of diversity. And I am sure uh, that today we will also discuss um, in, the, in the opening panel, but also in the second one. This also is inviting us to rethink the foundations of EU asylum policy more generally. Questions of responsibility sharing, questions of solidarity, the reform of the EU Dublin regulation that has been there for a while. It hasn't yet happened. We still have the same asylum system at EU level than since 2015, actually since the early uh, 90s uh, with the EU Dublin system. Um, and last, lessons learned from other countries, really. So this is why we have a second panel dedicated to Turkey. All right, so we have a wonderful panel. We have a really great panel. We have three presentations, um, uh, starting with uh, Meltem Ineli, um, who was uh, co-authoring and is co-authoring the kickoff piece and is co-editing the forum together with me and I'm very glad about that. Meltem, you have the floor. Thank you very Please. much Sergio and thank you very much for everyone participating inside and online. Uh, so today this is to promote our new forum on the displacement from Ukraine and activation of the temporary protection directive. As Sergio mentioned, the objective is to provide an overview of how temporary protection is being implemented in EU member states, but also uh, try to identify lessons learned, good practices and things to avoid in the future in responding uh, massive flood situations. Because uh, we know that in different parts of the world, uh, massive fluctuations happening, migratory pressures are happening, uh, there are ways to avoid certain pitfalls and improve protection by learning lessons from other parts of the world. So the objective, as Sergio mentioned, is there. Uh, today I will start with, <clears throat> apologies, uh, I will start with the Temporal Protection Directive first. I will provide an overview of what it entails for those of you who are not very familiar. Um, the title of my presentation today is Temporal Protection Directive, a new era in the EU asylum policy question mark. The question marks mean this is very early days and we will see uh, the hospitable approach of the EU in responding to mass fluctuation from Ukraine would be replicated in future instances. So this is uh, the issue I will try to focus on today. So let's, when we start uh, with an overview of the Temporal Protection Directive, 
In a nutshell, this was a directive adopted in 2001, but it has a certain activation mechanism for it to be activated. First, the Commission has to uh, prepare a proposal, then the Council has to adopt a decision with a qualified majority. And we didn't see this piece, uh, which was tailored to respond to massive fluctuations, when the 2015 happened, when more than 1 million uh, migrants and refugees arrived in the EU shores, uh, Greece and Italy. We didn't see it when the Taliban takeover and a certain number of, of a considerable number of uh, Afghans came to the EU borders. Uh, of course, there are complicated reasons behind it, but I think, in my personal opinion, it all boils down to political will. So there was no political will to activate it in the nearly two decades after it has been adopted. It has been activated for the first time, and it was a very rapid process. Uh, when Russia began in its invasion in Ukraine, the Commission uh, prepared a proposal after a few days and the Council adopted it in less than a week. Uh, when we look at the objectives of this directive, the objectives are twofold. Establishing minimum standards for giving temporary protection in the end, event of a massive fluctuation, and also to promote a balance of efforts between the solidarity in burden and responsibility sharing between member states in receiving and bearing the consequences of a massive flux, because we know that massive fluctuations create a number of considerable challenges for host states, especially states neighboring the country of origin. So with the Council's implementation, uh, implement, uh, implementing decision now, these are the groups that are eligible for temporary protection in the EU. The Ukrainian nationals residing in Ukraine who have been displaced uh, after the conflict as well as their family members, stateless persons and uh, third country nationals who benefited from international protection uh, in Ukraine uh, before the conflict began and as well as their family members. And lastly, the Council uh, requires member states to either grant temporary protection or adequate national protection to those fleeing uh, and who are unable to return in safe and durable conditions to their country of origin. So these three groups, uh, what the Council requires member states to grant temporary protection, but member states are free to grant uh, temporary protection to a broader group fleeing Ukraine. Um, when we look at the rights of temporary protection beneficiaries, we see that these are actually uh, the rights which seek to satisfy the immediate needs of, of those fleeing uh, Ukraine. Uh, these include, I would say, in my opinion, a decent category of rights because um, it includes temporary resident permits, right to education, right to access to labor market, though certain restrictions may apply, uh, right to shelter, which means uh, which translates into suitable accommodation. And um, since the Council decided not to implement Article 11 of the Temporary Protection Directive, uh, those who fall within the scope of temporary protection can choose the member state they wish to apply for asylum, which is a very different concept when we think the Dublin rules. Uh, so they have a certain freedom of movement as well once they get the resident permits. Um, when it will come to an end, it will come to an end uh, after three years. So the directive has a time limit, which is absent in Turkish law. I'm sure we will hear about it in the second panel. Uh, but before, if the if the conflict uh, ends in Ukraine, hopefully uh, the council can terminate temporary protection status before uh, the three years. Um, so when we look at the benefits, what kind of benefits Central Protection Directive might uh, provide both for member states and the protected persons. So temporary protection is a group protection. It gives immediate status and rights, access to rights. And member states does not have to do RSD or any kind of international protection uh, procedures. Therefore, this saves uh, time, workforce and money for member states and give immediate uh, access to rights for the displaced persons. This is a very new thing. The freedom of movement for the temporary protection beneficiaries is a novel development with the Council's implementing decision. This is a new development, as I say, and a radical uh, change of approach compared to what EU rules uh, in relation to freedom of movement for uh, asylum seekers as well as uh, protection beneficiaries. Uh, therefore, these are these are the three and the fairly distinct category of rights are the main benefits that TPD provides. Let me look at witnesses. Um, TPD has never been implemented before in the last two decades. Member states, some of them, failed to transpose the directive into their national laws properly. 
And we have very few data on the transposition progress. Uh, we have an Odysseus report from where Greg Arnold and uh, Marcus Gonzalo has drafted, but this is quite old as well. It was uh, prepared in 2007. <laughs> Uh, there was uh, some new reports from ECRE, for instance, I was taking a look at it, and um, it was saying that some member states failed to really transpose all the requirements and all the standards provided in the Tempo Protection Directive and the Council's implementing decision, and there are many gaps in national laws. And, um, I have known from the panels I have been participating that like judges or administrative uh, officials also in certain member states have difficulties in, for instance, identifying child trafficking or registering people. And these are the challenges that stem from the fact that uh, this was a directive which has never been used. So member states in some certain aspects are not fully aware of how to do this. They're trying to create their own ways to fill the gaps. And when we talk about an EU approach, Temper Protection Directive leaves out many crucial aspects such as procedures. Registration procedures it is uh, fairly uh, silent. Access to effective remedy and uh, challenge decisions in relation to temporary protection. These are some of the challenges that I have been uh, hearing from different officials or, or you know uh, lawyers and uh, academics. And this is also a directive that belongs to another era of CS. This was before even you know, the CS, after Tamper, it was the, after uh, Eurodac, this was the second uh, instrument that has been adopted within the scope of EU uh, asylum policy. Therefore, uh, it only recommends and provides minimum standards. <coughs> there are no common standards, but only minimum st standards. And this gives leeway to member states adopting and regulating different aspects of temporary protection quite freely and uh, makes it difficult to reach an EU-wide approach uh, I say. Um, one of the things uh, about like weaknesses, and these are some of the weaknesses, but uh, aside from these weaknesses, there are some challenges which I will mention in a moment, but today I wanted to focus on whether what we have seen recently is a paradigm sh shift in the EU asylum policy. So will we see the implementation or activation of the TPD when we have a mass influx situation from a country where the people are non-Europeans, non-white, non-Christian uh, masses? So this will be the test, I think, for the TPD's future in a sense that when we have activation of the TPD to protect people coming outside of Europe where uh, the majority may not have the uh, perfect integration prospect, I think we will understand whether TPD would be useful in future instances as well. The second uh, kind of uh, change in EU perceptions and approach, I think is the, to give right to see, uh, right to seek asylum in any member state that people actually wishes to do. I mean, this is the opposite of Dublin. We have been discussing Dublin in the, I don't know, it's like <laughs> in every refugee law conference, uh, I think I've been participating. Uh, we are discussing Dublin and whether there's a, uh, there will be a good revision, whether it will be abolished. What we have seen that actually, uh, with just political will, we can just abolish Dublin and provide a humane approach to see just where to seek asylum and protection. So no Dublin question mark. If you can do it in the context of temporary protection directive, this can be done for asylum procedures and international protection applications as well. But we will see this as well. This is quite early days. And finally, the uh, the Council's taking back implementation of Article 11 of the TPD, which foresees uh, taking back temporary protection beneficiaries from one state to another, uh, similar to Dublin rules. Um, this is a very important decision, which hopefully will be replicated in the future instances and activation of the temporary protection directive in future instances. But uh, the last point is perhaps we will see whether this is a paradigm shift when we know what the Parliament and the Council will say about the uh, force majeure regulation proposal. So uh, in the EU Pact on Migration, TPD was this close to being repealed because the Commission uh, proposed to repeal the directive. But we don't know at the uh, now whether the Commission will insist on repealing the TPD and introducing immediate protection status instead, or it will continue to live and prosper. So this is one of the uh, aspects. Finally, the challenges. 
And I'm sure I will not go in depth to that because I'm sure in the second panel, we have a lot to learn in relation to these challenges because every mass fluctuation brings certain challenges, short-term and long-term. Short-term challenges include, and we will touch upon that uh, in the second panel, registration, data collection, protection and sharing, satisfying immediate needs because providing shelter, adequate protection standards and a right to education for kids is or, or access to labor market for millions of people, like in Poland now, it's not easy. Even if you have the decent laws, there's the implementation gaps and there's the capacity of each member state, which are quite diverse in the union. So this would be one of the challenges. Of course, there are special challenges, which I'm sure Yulia might touch upon on, such as protection of un unaccompanied minors, uh, preventing child trafficking and human trafficking. And long-term challenges may include making all these rights provided in the temporary protection directive fully accessible in each and every member state this would be i think the most important challenge therefore uh without saying so much if you want to learn about the uh, good practices lessons learned as uh, you are mostly welcome to write as well. We are convening uh, at this forum, as Sergio mentioned, and please take a look at it. And we are, we are adding posts each week and we will continue adding posts. So um, yes, hopefully we can uh, continue our debate on TP whole day. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much, Melvin. Next speaker is Eleni Karagerbu. Lund University. She's also part of the SAIL consortium. Um, and uh, she's actually co written a piece with uh, Professor Gregor Noll, Gothenburg University, that is in the pipeline. It will be soon available in the forum, dealing with um, a case of solidarity question mark when reading the EU responses. So, Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. And I mean, thank you, uh, Miriam and, and Melton for putting uh, together this great event. Uh, of course, special thanks to Meltem and, and her great uh, team from uh, Suleiman uh, <laughs> University um, for really warm hospitality and for ensuring a smooth uh, you know, functioning of, of the workshop. So I'm, I'm really excited to be officially part of the ASILE uh, project. Uh, as, as Sergio mentioned, I'm, I've recently joined the uh, Gothenburg uh, team uh, working together with Gamze and Gregor on questions of legal responsibility. But indeed, my presentation today will um, focus on, on a topic uh, that I've dedicated to years of, of research, uh, and that is solidarity in the EU asylum law and policy. And we will be drawing uh, on this uh, draft paper that we co-authored with Gregor Noll uh, to be published in the ASEA forum. Um, so, I mean, what, what we seek to do with, with this um, paper is basically to question and, and problematize the use of, of the solidarity vocabulary by the EU when it is portraying uh, its response to the Ukrainian displacement. Hence the question mark, is it really receive a, a, a case of solidarity at receiving uh, uh, in protecting Ukrainian refugees in the EU? So, um, what we argue um, is that it is basically wrong, at least drawing on solidarity's conceptual history, and I will uh, go back to that in a minute, it is wrong to analyze this welcoming policy for Ukrainians fleeing war and this kind of massive joint action uh, in activating the uh, temporal protection directive through the lens of, of solidarity. I mean, the branding itself, like solidarity uh, uh, toolbox, is problematic. Uh, and we argue that it stands in the way of, of seeing another logic behind. And this is uh, an alliance logic that is at work here. OK, I mean, um, let me just first give you the, the context, uh, right? Um, so with regard to the EU's uh, approach, uh, to um, people fleeing uh, the um, Russian invasion in, in Ukraine. So you will see the uh, language of, of solidarity is being repeatedly referred to in, in different formulations, in various EU documents and by different actors, uh, compassion and solidarity, uh, unity in solidarity, solidarity in action, financial solidarity, real solidarity, as you see um, uh, in the uh, commission communication, 
um, also kind of uh, it's put in, in terms of generosity and, and a unified sense of purpose. Um, and, and then also, if you look at the statement by uh, the president of the European Commission, you know, uh, it's about an open arms uh, approach to Ukrainian and uh, the Commission will mobilize every effort and every euro to support uh, the Eastern member states that are under particular uh, pressure. So how this uh, basically um, solidarity has materialized, at least so far, um, as Meltem said, through the activation of uh, the Temporal Protection Directive, immediate protection for those fleeing the war, uh, which was promoted by the Commission as a, a, a solution, uh, benefiting not only uh, refugees themselves, uh, but also uh, the EU and especially uh, countries under pressure, the uh, neighboring countries uh, to uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, and, um, and you see these countries, we see that uh, amongst those countries receiving um, uh, people displaced from Ukraine are also uh, Sandian countries. Uh, we have uh, uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, we have Slovakia. And I think that it's interesting, uh, or it, it should be noted here, that the data of the arrivals that you see on, on the slide, in, especially in Schengen countries, represent border crossings into the countries. But the estimation, of course, is that a large number of people have moved onwards to other countries. Like, And this is considered a de facto, so to say, uh, so to say sharing of, of responsibility with people spread across uh, borders. Um, but of course, the, the focus was not only uh, in, uh, on, on protection, but also on support, as we said, to these EU countries under pressure. So um, central to the EU's response has been um, uh, financial support, right? Um, uh, but also operational support for border management, for example, uh, Frontex personnel um, by, and, and also other personnel by EU agencies was deployed at focal border points, such as Romania and Moldova and Ukraine. But um, another uh, also uh, measure was uh, the solidarity transfers through the so-called solidarity platform, right? A kind of a physical, the possibility for physical distribution of people um, uh, from uh, fleeing uh, Ukraine in different EU countries. Um, and again, as, as Sergio mentioned earlier, this comes really at stark uh, contrast to uh, the way in which the EU uh, has given effect to the principle of solidarity in the context of migration emergencies um, earlier, um, uh, emergencies unfolding in particular at its external borders. Uh, I will remind you that in 2015, there was no activation of, of the Temporary Protection Directive. Instead, it was this um, uh, EU relocation scheme uh, that was uh, implemented um, uh, to transfer primarily Syrian refugees from Greece and Italy to other member states. And in fact, the Court of Justice of the EU has suggested back then that the situation at the time uh, was characterized by mass daily crossings and it demanded a rapid and far reaching response and, and uh, thus the uh, and therefore the mandatory quota uh, implemented with this EU relocation scheme was actually deemed more appropriate than the temporary protection directive, which is based on voluntary um, uh, commitments. Um, and I should also say that um, back then, refugee agency was assumed to be, you know, a bad thing, uh, resulting basically in an unequal distribution of, of responsibility. And this was reproduced uh, in uh, um, the reasoning of the Court of Justice of the EU, um, again, in relation to that relocation mechanism. Uh, but um, interestingly enough, with the Ukrainian refugees, being handled in the temporary protection framework and being entitled to enter the EU without a visa, refugee agency exceptionally turns into a force for good and turns into uh, also good in terms of solidarity. And again, just to remind you that um, uh, in the context of the 2015, so to say, refugee movements, 
there were countries along the, the Balkan route that unilaterally have actually facilitated, have tried to facilitate uh, the uh, movement of mainly Syrians onward, right, to uh, the countries uh, uh, of the preferred destination of, of the refugees. But that, uh, in, in a case, in the Jafari case before the Court of Justice of the EU, uh, was considered as completely undermining the Dublin system, right? So the court really um, um, uh, uphold, uh, upheld, actually, the uh, integrity of the system, even during uh, crisis. Um, and then, I mean, perhaps also uh, uh, another um, uh, emergency, migration emergency was the uh, 2020 Great Turkish border crisis, um, when again there was a mass, uh, a mass movement of, again, mainly Syrian refugees uh, uh, trying to enter uh, uh, Greece. Uh, and, and Europe, and that was actually, this movement was framed as a hybrid attack uh, to the borders of, of the EU. So the, the solidarity uh, functioned there as a unity to defend borders, right? And, and to uh, make sure that uh, uh, Greece in that particular uh, uh, case will have actually all the, uh, the resources to kind of avert this, this um, uh, attack. Uh, the same goes also for the 2021 EU Belarusian border crisis. Here again, the language of solidarity uh, was used quite vocally. The vice president, Margarita Skinas, um, uh, argued that, again, this kind of attack, hybrid attack, uh, and the instrumentalization of refugees by the uh, uh, Lukashenko's uh, regime will only solidify uh, EU uh, solidarity, and, and that would actually materialize through temporary and exceptional measures um, uh, in, in, in the uh, countries at the external borders. Okay, so, so how, how do we make sense then of, of, of solidarity, right? Because we have, we've seen um, uh, a kind of cooperation uh, amongst EU countries framed as solidarity, aiming at defending borders and basically containing populations, excluding in particular certain uh, migrant populations. But of course, we've seen in the case of, uh, of, of Ukraine, cooperation framed as solidarity towards um, a particular, again, population of people uh, manifested itself through uh, an open arms approach. So how to make sense? Then what we did with Gregor is basically to um, look at the conceptual history of solidarity. And I mean, I'll try to very briefly uh, discuss what uh, kind of our findings. I mean, historically, the concept of solidarity, we, we found that is linked to cooperative arrangements to kind of avert, to avoid threats to a particular status quo. So in particular, here we look at um, French solidarism uh, as particularly if you were influential for the European project, which was basically designed to offer a compromise uh, uh, by the bourgeoisie to win the, the workers away from, from revolution, right? To keep away from the more radical position of class struggle uh, taken by the socialists. So if we, and again, I mean, we, we see that logic again in the interwar period, I will spare you the, the details of that, but moving to the early days of European integration, and especially in the field of asylum, we see the same logic, like solidarity as kind of, again, an alliance to manage migration. Um, and this alliance basically uh, engenders uh, or focuses on immobilization of, of irregular migration including refugees, of course, who were perceived as a threat or as an anomaly, so to say, to the internal market logic. Uh, and of course, this is corroborated by long and ongoing practice of the Dublin system. So precisely as French solidarism sought to avert the self-organization of revolutionary French workers, EU solidarity uh, seeks to avert the self-organization of, of migrants and, and manage their, their movement. And I mean, also we see, as I said, that the SIA structure and, and rationale is based um, not really on, on solidarity, but on a solidarity gap, right? Back in the 1990s, there was 
um, or EU countries um, failed basically in the whole uh, normative framework failed to respond to large refugee movements from Bosnia and later Kosovo. And the debate on, on, uh, on burden sharing did not really uh, provide any meaningful uh, agreement. So member states have been reluctant to receive refugees in their territories. So they invested in, in a kind of uh, immobilization or containment logic through the Dublin system. Of course, this logic then led to different asymmetries, having uh, countries at the external borders taking the great bulk of responsibility and then solidarity basically emerged as, as a way to um, kind of iron out uh, the, uh, these asymmetries, right? Um, so basically the rhetoric and function of solidarity has been more of an apology for the Dublin rationale rather than a kind of a revision of an unfair system. It did not really question the fundamental inequality in, in the system. And I uh, now come to um, uh, almost like uh, to the end, um, because you may ask, but all right, but then we see um, uh, solidarity uh, also as mobilization, right? Uh, and we see that not only today in 2020, uh, 2022, but also earlier um, with uh, the humanitarian evacuation program, uh, following the Kosovo crisis, which was really a success story in the history of responsibility sharing, right? And the point of the program back then um, was to airlift uh, arriving uh, Kosovars from North Macedonia territory onwards to other states. And that was crucial for NATO, mobilizing Kosovar civilians with this program was crucial for achieving the political goals of its military intervention. So sharing the burden of refugee protection was an expression of precisely an alliance logic and solved really uh, strategic problems in the NATO campaign. So this strongly resonates with the mobilization of Ukrainian civilians across borders uh, open for them right now. Today, support to Ukraine, we argue, is a matter of, of course, providing support and intelligence, but it's also uh, uh, providing uh, or ensuring security for Ukrainians. And I think as it was really nicely put by Sergio Meltem, Leza and, and Lina in their kickoff contribution to the Asile Forum, humanitarianism in, in this case is or was actually the, the second, the only second best solution on offer uh, at, as the first one going basically to Ukraine's defense was out of the table. Right? So allying to assist Ukraine, particularly by, by mobilizing Ukrainians um, as was the case with the Kosovars, basically contributed to the achievement of the political goals of, of states. So where does this uh, uh, leave us? Is it correct to talk about reception of Ukrainian refugees uh, uh, in terms of solidarity? At least, is it historically accurate? And, and we answer, uh, of course, in the negative, um, the open arms response, as well as previous closed arms, approaches um, uh, support the claim that there is this kind of instrumentalist concept of alliance at, at play here and calling that solidarity would be a misnomer right and and if i could use these two pillars of the um asila uh, project that, that sergio used yesterday containment and mobility we have containment as the rule um, and, and solidarity as a means somehow to achieve that rule, but we also have mobility as the exception, as long as, of course, mobility does not disturb the status quo, and as long as it is required by the higher political uh, goal. And as, as um, also stated by Joan Van Sel, again, in one of the contributions to the forum, um, this political goal was to project power against Russia, against Russian aggression. So the EU had no alternative but protect Ukrainians, sowing this kind of unity in the face of a, of a kind of an existential crisis for itself, for Europe, but also for member states, primarily as NATO main members. So thank you. I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Eleni, for raising all these points. This really makes us think, invites us to think a number of really crucial points and foundations. Um, 
of um, that we are working with in the in the asylum project. And this higher political goal, I mean, it always makes me think of governments like that are clearly backsliding on the rule of law, like the Polish government, the Hungarian government, that have been against relocation, that actually also didn't agree to activate the temporary protection directive, quasi relocation possibility when applicants expressly doing so, and that are not compliant with EU law. So I wonder how that plays out in these higher political goals. If the higher political goals include goals of governments that are clearly against EU values in what they are doing, I think this is also needs to be tailored in the in the in the story uh, when we talk about the inequality, inequality in the sense member states not fully and equally complying with the rules. So this this is something that um, um, you know. Your presentation also made me think, and I really very much value your, your contribution. Thank you so much. So next presentation is Julia uh, Kienest, uh, Arcus University. Um, actually, Julia uh, prepared uh, together with Jens and, and Nick uh, Tan a contribution in the forum that is available there. It's been published. You can check it out. Uh, a great um, input uh, dealing with many elements, including the question of discrimination as well. Uh, Julia, I uh, will look forward to giving your presentation. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Sergio, for the introduction. And um, again, thank you so much, Malcolm, and uh, to your team as well for inviting us here. I think we are all very happy to meet in person again. Um, yeah, um, my intervention today mainly relies on the, the contribution that uh, Sergio already mentioned, that um, Nick um, and Jens are both here, luckily, as well. Uh, we come and, uh, jointly contributed to the ASIL Forum. Um, and it was called preferential, differential, or discriminatory question mark <laughs> EU protection arrangements for persons displaced from Ukraine. Um, so this was uh, an issue that caused a bit of an outrage, I would say, after the activation um, of the TPD, um, which is not surprising because, as Melton has mentioned before, the TPD existed since 2001. There were several incidents where it could have been used, but it was not used. And I think it's also not so surprising that we are today lawyers here who are looking into the semantics of the politicians actually, um, because it's very relevant in this context. Um, and that was also shown by how politicians talk about the activation of the TPD and the context surrounding it. So um, the people here might know um, I'm from Austria. So this is one of the, prime examples always for me. Um, and the Austrian People's Party is quite notorious for, um, and they are in the government, for um, their anti-refugee uh, stand. And that uh, was shown, for example, in 2021, in summer, um, when the international forces withdrew from Afghanistan and we still insisted on the forced uh, returns to Afghanistan until our constitutional court didn't allow it anymore. And then now uh, the same people talk completely differently about the Ukrainian situation. Um, it's a narrative of neighborhood solidarity. Um, it's uh, yeah, our European family that we are talking about and our obligation to help them. Um, so this of course has not resonated well uh, with some people who have come here before and uh, received very different statements and Austria was not alone with this. Um, also from Bulgaria, there were similar uh, remarks. Poland and Hungary completely changed um, their stance when it comes to Ukrainian refugees. So um, this is um, a first observation um, when it comes to the, to the activation of the TPD in and of itself. Um, and of course, the narrative around it. 
Um, however, in our contribution, we looked at um, various aspects of discrimination. And I think um, we have to be very careful not to convolute them because, um, yeah, it, there might be different answers depending on the circumstances that you're looking to or the aspect of, of the situation. Um, so we looked into the access to the EU territory, the secondary movement within the EU territory that we've heard of, uh, about already, the scope of beneficiaries uh, of the TPD, the interaction of the TPD with national asylum systems, and the standard of treatment under the TPD versus um, those of uh, asylum seekers or recognized refugees. So um, the second issues, uh, issue that I mentioned was um, the access to the EU territory under the TPD. And here, Ukrainians have a bit of a different starting point because they have uh, visa-free access already uh, to the Schengen area since 2017 because of an arrangement that was made uh, under the framework of the so-called European neighborhood policy. And that allows them to stay and travel in the Schengen area for up to 90 days without a visa if they have a biometric passport. Um, this uh, arrangement was adopted uh, on the basis of certain objective criteria, certain benchmarks that those countries had to meet, um, such as the document security, border management, migration and asylum, um, public policy, uh, public order and security, and fundamental rights. Um, so. The fact that they can travel visa uh, uh, visa free to the to the Schengen area poses the question from a, a discrimination perspective whether they are even in a relevantly similar situation as other forced um, migrants or um, if it's a completely uncomparable situation, so to say. And we said that this uh, visa free arrangement with some countries and not with others per se is legitimate. Um, because it's just a, a recognized instrument of selective immigration control. However, um, we reached the conclusion that you need to look um, at the situation and, uh, of the circumstances of uh, forced migrants. So visa-free and uh, visa-required forced migrants can be on an equal footing uh, when it comes to their protection need. And we looked at this uh, from the lens of Article 14 ECHR. There, there are many um, provisions that uh, forbid the discrimination. Um, however, we, we looked at it from the, from the lens of Article 14, which uh, requires not only a discrimination, but also an accessorial right, which for people fleeing from Ukraine would probably be Article 3 um, ECHR, Article 8 ECHR, and Article 4 of the Ford Protocol of the ECHR. And under this perspective, it does not automatically follow that um, because they have visa-free access, they would also um, fall out of the, the discrimination framework, so to say. Um, and this becomes very this becomes very obvious when you look at, for example, Russian. Um, dissidents, which is an example that uh, Jens came up with, which uh, who might also have just the same protection needs as the Ukrainians fleeing, but who, who would uh, receive very different treatment probably at the border. Um, and then there have been other reported instances of just blatant um, racial discrimination at the border, where we felt like there's not even a need to analyze this so much on, uh, from a legal perspective, because the discrimination is very obvious. Um, so that was, for example, um, Arabic and, and African students who apparently had been uh, um, not allowed to leave Ukraine, Ukraine um, and other so, uh, such instances. Then the third issue that we looked to was secondary movement within the EU. We've already heard that um, that is very, very different under the TPD. Uh, under the TPD, people are allowed to more or less choose the country that they go to, which under the Dublin regime was not allowed for asylum seekers. Um, here, our conclusion was that because uh, this uh, preferential treatment is of relevance to the protection need, um, and it seems proportionate um, that it would 
not be that problematic in, in our point of view. Um, however, it also has to be said that um, the commission in their guidelines um, stated that the, that people cannot simultaneously hold resident permits in several member states country uh, member states. So it has to be withdrawn if the person moves to another member state. So there is a, a limit to this um, free choice. Um, obviously, it's relevant who is even covered um, by the TPD. So we looked um, at the scope of beneficiaries. So um, it's three groups of people who fall underneath the, the scope of the council decision, actually. And that's Ukrainian nationals uh, residing in the country before the date of the invasion, stateless persons and nationals of third countries who benefit from international protection uh, in Ukraine before um, the invasion and their family members. However, the council decision leaves open whether the TPD applies to stateless persons without refugee status and other permanent residents um, who are unable to return um, and also those who have temporary residency in Ukraine and who cannot safely return. Um, and this is uh, very relevant uh, when it comes to how uh, the TPD is on the one hand implemented in the member states and on the other hand, um, what the standard of treatment is under the TPD versus um, other protection regimes. Um, so the TPD allows uh, a simultaneous application under uh, for asylum. So um, it leaves it up to the member states. Oh, actually, it, member states have to allow um, asylum applications, but it leaves it to them whether they deal with that claim later or if um, the people can be simultaneously under the same track. Um, and this can be very relevant because uh, the standard of uh, of treatment that they get under the TPD is different. And we found that, and uh, Melton has listed already <laughs> what are the rights under TPD. So they are somewhat um, better than for asylum seekers. Um, and I think it was Catherine Rulard in a recent SEP seminar that's, uh, who said um, that this also shows uh, that the, um, how the rights of asylum seekers have worsened since um, the TPD was invented and um, the TPD rights are somewhat less than for people who have recognized refugee status. And this led us to the conclusion that time plays a very important factor here because forced migrants and um, potential refugees under the TPD still have their rights under the qualification directive. So with time, their rights must come to an equal footing. Um, and then it depends on whether their, their right is assessed individually or not. So um, we will see how this plays out in the member states. Um, and with this, I think we can move into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are moving indeed into the discussion of the panel. We have three discussions, um, excellent discussions, starting with Fatima Khan, professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, an asylum partner. Then we will have Jens Bedstedt Hansen, professor at Har Harpus University, who has co-authored um, the piece with Julia and Nitan that was just presented. And then we will have online Julia EOP at the University College London. So uh, Fatima, perhaps you can move closer to us. Should we switch on the I can switch, yes. Huh? Yes. We really do want to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps it's better if you Good morning, everybody. Um, let me first say a very big thank you to Malcolm and her team 
Thank you very much for the very warm hospitality. It's indeed been a pleasure to come up to Turkey, even it took me, even though it took me 30 hours to get here. <laughs> also, thank you very much to Miriam and uh, Sergio for putting this together. I'm very happy to be here, especially since I cannot be with you in June. Um, to the three um, presenters this morning, you've given me a lot of food for thought. I thought I was prepared to be a discussion this morning, but you have put in so much more um, in your emphasis. It's one thing that I've done, I've done the reading, but your emphasis on um, certain aspects of your, of your writing has um, perhaps in some ways changed my opinion on what I wanted to say. So let's see, let's see where I go. And I, and I now feel that I should have taken up the invitation uh, from Sergio to write a piece uh, for this forum. I very, very bravely said no to him, <laughs> um, to my disadvantage today. I have done a lot of reading though. I have done the reading of all the presenters. I've in addition done the reading uh, by Baldazar and I've done the reading of uh, Joanne Van Salm. And I've come up with a whole lot of questions. But when I did the reading of uh, Jans and Julia and, uh, um, and Nick, uh, I did get some answers to the questions that I posed for myself. I'm going to um, structure my intervention today around five very broad themes. It's not so much about Ukraine, uh, but it's about the, the, the themes uh, that, that um, yeah, five themes. And my first uh, um, uh, theme here would be the concept of temporary protection. Uh, secondly, I'm going to address responses to emergency situations. What is an emergency situation? Thirdly, responding to a conflict in the neighboring state. Fourthly, uh, large scale displacements. And then finally, this um, whole concept of a humanitarian assistance. So uh, please do bear in mind that I'm all the way down there from South Africa in Cape Town, and everybody sitting up here is from up in the north. So our perspectives are in, in so many ways very, very different. And I guess I'm here to share the different, share my experience, right? So the this notion of a temporary protection is not a new, new notion in, by any means. Uh, um, it was mentioned uh, even, uh, even before the Bosnian conflict. Um, there have been writings on uh, the temporariness of refugee status, the fact that refugee status should never be a permanent status, that you should also come to, that, that it must come to an end at some point. Uh, and just to give you an indication, of course, on how it has in, evolved, when the EU speaks about temporary protection today, it's not what they have in mind. It is completely involved. And uh, tem temporary protection is to take you perhaps to the paper written by Alice Edwards, um, uh, who worked for a long time with the UNHR and is currently a professor in, in Melbourne, I believe, but somewhere in Australia. And she, she, in her definition of temporary protection, she mentions a couple of things. She said, it is number one for a limited period. That, that is obvious, it's temporary. It's for a limited period. It is at a standard lower than that is lower than afforded by the convention. Um, but when again, when we look at the temporary protection and having heard Malton this morning, um, it has evolved since uh, uh, Alice Edwards wrote about this in, in 2012 in her paper on temporary protection derogation and the 1951 UN convention. What we've noticed here is that it looks like the temporary protection now offers a better, uh, um, well, more benefits or something better than asylum. And we have to pose the question at this point, why? Why is it that this temporary protection is a better offer? And I am now going to take you to all the way down to South Africa, where we have done this already. We did this in 2009, where we had conflict in our neighboring country, not, not external aggression, right? No foreign occupation, but it's, it's an internal situation. 
in Zimbabwe, there was clearly a political situation, so a complete breakdown of the economy in Zimbabwe, and South Africa attracted what, what could be said as a large-scale movement. I remember reading in the newspaper at the time, uh, the newspapers used to say oh, anything between one to five million Zimbabweans in South Africa, they could be right, I mean, but there's a huge gap between one and five million, right? So, yes, a large number of Zimbabweans. And the Zimbabweans at that point when they entered South Africa, most of them applied for asylum. So the asylum system was completely uh, overwhelmed. And what the government did then was they introduced a special dispensation for Zimbabweans. So this is a favor for Zimbabweans, right? A special permit, a temporary permit, and this temporary permit gave you the right to work immediately, gave you the right to stay in South Africa for four years without having to go every few months like asylum seekers have to, to renew their permits. It gave you the right to education, it gave you the right to freedom of movement. So a vast range of rights, right? In so many ways, the equivalent of the temporary protection granted to Ukrainians now. And again, I ask myself, and, you, and, and, and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm going to pose to you, is this a favor to Ukrainians? Is it a favor? Are they being selected? Are they a chosen group? In my opinion, the answer is no, right? Because they are still getting less than the convention. With the convention, there is a, an avenue, there is a pathway to a durable solution. Uh, your, your, your status can come to an end, right? So in, in Zimbabwe, or, or with this, uh, this Zimbabwean dispensation, the first issue was a four-year permit. That was renewed for a further three years. And after that, it was renewed for a further three years. And then what happened? It was at the beginning of this year, end of last 2021, December 2021, the last week of the year, it was just abruptly removed, right? That's it, it's the end of it. You now have one year to decide what you want to do. You can either stay here, but if you find another form of um, uh, legal status, or you have to return to Zimbabwe. So is that a favor? In my opinion, it's not a favor. And I'm going to take you to the two terms that are used here over and over, containment and deterrence. So in my opinion, or oh, um, the Zimbabwean dispensation permit, the uh, temporary protection here is actually a sophisticated form of containment, right? You come in here, we will know exactly who you are. You're given a temporary permit. You are contained. We know exactly who you are. And in the end, we can decide, right? It can be over when we decide it's over. Who knows how long this conflict is going to last? It's a three-year permit now. Even if the whole last work for three years, it's the end of that. Is the situation in Ukraine over? You have to ask yourselves, if Europe says go home, what do they go home to? Will they be prepared to go home? So if you look at the South African situation and after that was after a, an 11 year period of that permit, some of them had been on, on a temporary asylum permit before that. So a lot of the Zimbabweans had been in South Africa for not 10 or 12 years, but maybe 16 or 17 years. And as a, and this is what, what maybe an avenue for future research. And this is something that we haven't done is that um, number one, the impact of that kind of status, temporary status on children, right? Any child who's been in Zimbabwean child who came in at the age of three or four and has lived in South Africa for 17 years, is now in their 20s or in their, you know, some of them in their, in their late 20s, but they have no connection with Zimbabwe. Had they been through the refugee system, they would probably have had if not citizenship, then a permanent residence in South Africa. So that is an aspect that, that you can consider. But I'm going to move off from that point now. And I'm going to go to my three, my next three interventions uh, on <coughs> number one, emergency situations, number two, large scale displacements, and number three, conflict in the neighboring state. And I want you to 
uh, again, using the words of uh, Alice Edwards, look at it through the lens of law versus pragmatism, right? So, an, an emergency situation, right? What is an emergency situation? And I, I, I think one can fairly say that what is happening uh, in Ukraine or to Ukrainians or Ukrainian fleeing, that so that is an emergency situation. It is it is a fact that you have uh, bombs dropping in Ukraine. It is a it is it is external aggression, right? So it is easily uh, recognized and uh, as an emergency situation. And perhaps you know, and and, and us as lawyers or refugee lawyers, we always want to see uh, one standard apply to everybody, you know. Um, and I think I've read that in one of the papers, perhaps it was in the opening paper, <laughs> um, where we say that uh, we, I think Sergio and Malton uh, stated that they wanted the same approach to everyone. Uh, and, and maybe, my apologies, I'm, I'm reading this wrong. But perhaps we should ask the question just from, from a pragmatic point of view, what is wrong in having a different approach if there is an emergency situation, right? I, I don't know exactly what the approach should be, but can you justify a different approach, right? If you have a group of refugees at your border and they are from the state where the bombs are dropping, should you or, or, or could you justifiably have a different approach? I, I haven't, um, would, you, would you say that that is um, yeah, I haven't given that that much thought, I think, but it is something that uh, we should give a lot of thought to uh, the whole concept of an emergency situation. I believe it was Thomas yesterday in his presentation that also spoke about this emergency mode that Europe is in now, and I, um, I haven't read that, I don't know uh, enough about that, but it is something that we should look at it a lot more closely. Then with regard to mass displacements or large scale displacements, um, again, you know, the question is, can large scale displacements, uh, can, can it in, uh, or should it be treated differently to, indiv to individuals approaching um, for asylum? Um, in, 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 in my region, uh, there are um, one can, one, one can I, I think perhaps uh, Europe can look to uh, the African region for an answer on this. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, uh, South African law, we, for example, have a section in our law, uh, section uh, 35 in our Refugees Act that speaks to, that speaks to uh, mass influx. And the minister, the minister may, the minister may invoke, the minister may, I'm just trying to find the section, right? The, um, so the minister has the authority to declare, um, to declare a group or a category of persons to be refugees, either conditionally or, or unconditionally, but subject to, subject to, um, or, or, sorry, and, and however, whatever conditions the minister imposes should be uh, in line with our constitution and in line with international law. Now, you heard me say that the minister may declare the entire group to be refugees. There is no need to have them relabeled because this is what we find here in Europe. We are finding a relabeling of persons of refugees into something else. Right? This happened with the Bosnians. This is happening now with the Ukrainians. The temporary protection does not, am I right, does not declare you to be a refugee. No, right? So that is not a favor. That is not a favor, right? But I don't know if there is a mechanism, but this is what we have in, in South African law. It hasn't been invoked. It hasn't, it, it hasn't been in, in, invoked yet, um, but Section 35 of our Act allows the minister allows the minister to do to do this but then in 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 africa we also have uh, uh, our extended definition 
uh, and our and this is mentioned by Elena yesterday. We have our extended definition, and our extended definition allows for refugee status for anyone that fled external aggression, foreign occupation, or events seriously disturbing the public order. So, are all Ukrainians, if, if they enter Europe, are they all seen as refugees because they haven't fled for individual persecution? They have fled general general risk that they are at. So in, in our extended uh, definition in the OAU, not only the OAU, I do believe you find that in, in the Americas and South, South America as well. And in addition, the UNHR, of course, also has a manner in which they grant group status and they call it the prima facie refugee status. Uh, and they grant refugee status by simply looking at the objective situation that people have fled. Right? I've given a note that I must conclude, right? So uh, <laughs> conflict in the neighboring state, this is what we're looking at. And so can you justifiably have a different approach if it is conflict in a neighboring state now? Um, uh, not just Africa, but the, uh, the Middle East and the East are used to this kind of conflict on the border, conflict on the neighboring state. If you look at a country uh, like Iran that hasn't signed the 51 Convention, their borders were open to Afghans, and a million Afghans at one point uh, resided in. So it, it is, an, um, I don't know if that's a form of solidarity, <laughs> but it is, it is most certainly an approach that has been used in the Middle East, it's been used uh, in Africa, in, by, uh, by Tanzania, by Kenya, where the borders have been wide open to allow Somali refugees and Rwandans and Burundians in, in large numbers, uh, amounting up to a million, up to a million or more. And now I come to my my final uh, uh, my final intervention. It's the whole question of, and perhaps I've made some of these points earlier on, like. Um, this humanitarian assistance versus asylum seekers and i'm 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 reminded of a mentor of mine um, professor the late professor barbara harold Bodden. she always said don't ever speak for the refugees ask them and so we have to ask you have to ask the ukrainians what is it that they want do they want the temporary protection do they want asylum do they understand this whole notion of uh, how they may be disadvantaged by this temporary protection? Or as Valsama said yesterday, uh, um, what does protection mean for them? I have asked this question on so many occasions to my refugee clients and I've asked them, you say you want protection, what do you mean by protection? And the range of answers are oh, just it's just just so vast whether they say oh i want my child to be in a school that is protection or i don't want to be killed by somebody or i want this or i want that so the range of what is meant for protection is is huge and perhaps uh, for further research i would encourage asking ukrainians what it is that they want and or undertaking a study of how many Ukrainians have applied for asylum as opposed to uh, uh, benefiting or making use of the template. I, I, am, I am going to conclude here. Thank you very much, Sergey. Discussion points. Uh, let's move immediately to Jens. Jens, if you can move close, close to, close to right. me, as by these participants can also see you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And once again, thanks to Melton and your team for organizing this fascinating event in many respects. Um, as uh, Yuri and Sergio already mentioned, <coughs> I'm one of the co authors of the uh, contribution uh, to the uh, ASIL forum on discrimination or uh, differential treatment or just preferential treatment. Uh, we discussed uh, my potential bias uh, as a discussant uh, of, uh, of Julia's presentation uh, and among the organizers and agreed that I could, uh, I could 
work around that uh, somehow. So I'll not say much about this discrimination issue because that was uh, perfectly well covered by Julia. I would like to just add a couple of remarks on aspects that, that she didn't touch upon. Uh, and again, like Julia, I also have been a bit sort of preoccupied by political semantics. And like in Austria, we also in Denmark have a People's Party. Um, and sometimes these radical nationalists say things more straightforwardly than, than, than mainstream politicians. Uh, uh, to begin with a quote from the uh, current chairman of the Danish People's Party, uh, which is, as you may know, quite anti-immigrant uh, and uh, xenophobic in general, he said, well, why shouldn't we receive these Ukrainians rather than others? Because they are good European Christians. That's quite straightforward. Uh, and of course, most other politicians wouldn't put it that way. But on the other hand, then sort of trying to break down their line of reasoning or justification of the differential treatment towards uh, reception of Ukrainians. Uh, I would say that some of their arguments are really not very strong. So one might, may end up suspe suspecting that they may somehow in hiding sort of uh, latently be also having some considerations about maybe not Christians, but at least European and white and what have we, good people versus some other people. Uh, two of the arguments which we have seen in Danish debates, and I'm sure also elsewhere, is uh, the uh, region of origin reasoning. Uh, and that sounds uh, valid, while at the same time I would say it's a rather, quite a relative concept. Uh, of course, Ukraine is quite much the region of origin as compared to, uh, to, to the first con one of the, fir the first countries of reception, Poland, Moldova, uh, Romania. Um, but if we take a wider perspective from Europe, uh, it doesn't really necessarily hold water. In my sort of scientific research for, for this, I, I found a function on the internet which is named distance calculator which simply gives you the distance uh, on land and, and air traffic uh, between various places. The distance from uh, Kiev to Copenhagen is only, I think, 60 kilometers uh, larger than the flight distance from Aleppo to Sofia, just to compare. So from the wider regional perspective or European perspective, it is a bit difficult to argue that Ukraine is necessarily the um, a part of the European region of, of origin as opposed to Syria. That depends very much uh, on the perspective you, you choose. Another uh, line of reasoning has been uh, reference to the fact that Ukrainians do not uh, arrive irregularly. Even uh, at least one, one uh, notable Danish politician has argued they don't, they don't use the smuggler services as opposed to other uh, asylum seekers. Uh, and I would say that is a plainly invalid argument in the first place, because they do not arrive irregularly due to the U EU decision to grant them visa exceptions. That, that, that simply follows logically. They can enter and move around uh, lawfully in a regular manner. And that's, so, so, so that's not a special feature with them. It's a special feature with EU policies, as was it well explained by Julia. And in that regard, I think there is perhaps also a difference towards the Kosovars and the example given by Eleni, because uh, although I haven't checked it yet, but I, I assume that the Kosovars were not visa exempt uh, in the first place in, in 1998 and 9. So, so, so they were, would formally be arriving regularly, but, but for, the, for the Ukrainians, <coughs> it is actually a pre-existing uh, preferential treatment due to the 2017 decision that, that you explained. Um, but the bottom line as regards discrimination is, um, I think, that, that there can be valid justifications, uh, but just some are not valid. And also, I think it begs questions for future treatment of asylum seekers and people granted protection, because some subsequent, some, some displaced persons arriving subsequently to the uh, Ukrainians may reasonably ask, why are we ex suspended or prohibited from accessing employment, maybe for protracted periods of asylum proceedings? Uh, why do we have very, very strict conditions for family reunification, even if granted asylum, as opposed to the Ukrainians? That, I think, will perhaps 
over time uh, represent or constitute new and, and certainly difficult and unanswered questions of um, discrimination in the light of the preferential treatment granted to the Ukrainians. And my, my, my simple perspective here is that we, sh we shouldn't question the reception and, and, and positive reception of, of Ukrainians, but rather think twice what implication it could have for future situations of uh, arrivals. Um, then my second um, remark will go on the issue of temporary protection versus uh, refugee or subsidiary protection status. Uh, th this has been really an issue and uh, Joan van Selm is uh, accounting very uh, clearly for that uh, also in her contribution to the uh, Asyl Forum. And that reminds me of uh, a quite old discussion I think Joanne was also involved in that actually those days. Um, I wrote together with Greg Nol a, a small contribution to a book back in 2000, uh, where we were concerned with uh, te the temporary protection because from the perspective of suspending refugee rights. Precisely as Joanne is explaining, there was a perception in the 1990s that temporary protection could be something uh, opposed to refugee status. Uh, and there, I think Joanne has a very strong point that uh, the advantage of the temporary protection directive is that it is it clarifies the issue uh, perfectly well. Um, Gregor and I were, were, were sort of concerned that in the light of the experience from the 1990s, and also a council decision, which was in the, the old third pillar pre, pre Amsterdam, uh, a council decision on burden sharing and temporary residence in, 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 in mass and flood situations. We had some concerns that it might be sort of undermining the convention refugee status. But that I think has been made perfectly clear in the temporary protection directive, uh, as we also mentioned in, in our uh, asylum forum contribution. It's stated at least three times uh, or three places in recital 10, in article three and in article 17, uh, that refugee status may well be uh, may, may, may well be held by those who are granted temporary protection under the directive. Um, in that sense, I think it's quite important that the terminology of the directive is not temporary protection status. And here I think words make a difference actually, because in some, in some jurisdictions such as the US, temporary protection is referred to as a status. But I think it's quite useful to avoid the term status, which is also avoided by the directive, and just talking about temporary protection as an arrangement, which is linked to certain entitlements, such as residence permit and, and, and the other things as Milsom explained. It is not a status as such. It may well be granted to people who genuinely fulfill the eligibility criteria for either convention refugee status and subsidiary protection status. It, I mean, late February, early March, I think it was difficult to tell whether the Ukrainians were uh, fulfilling those eligibility criteria. It may still be premature, and thanks to the temporary protection directive activation, we don't need to consider it at the moment. Well, there may be a few who have applied for asylum as they are entitled to do, but, but it's an advantage that, that we can postpone that decision. On the precondition that the temporary protection directive grants standards of treatment, which are largely compatible to those uh, prescribed by the refugee convention, as I think it does, uh, because there may be people having a presumptive refugee status among those under the directive. And that, of course, also relates to the duration of temporary protection under the directive. But I think the bottom line is that the rationale of temporary protection should be considered that it is based on administrative and policy considerations to uphold protection capacity by the two elements here, collective uh, eligibility criteria and the possibility to suspend individual asylum procedures. That, on the other hand, can also can only uh, be sustainable for a certain period of time. Uh, and it will, of course, be interesting to see what is happening once the temporary protection directive is being deactivated. Uh, that may be uh, then crucial uh, hard decisions to be made 
uh, not only and perhaps not so much to, to deactivate the directive, but then to decide the fate of those whose temporary protection will come to an end. Uh, my last remark is about uh, solidarity versus rule of law. It was just inspired by some, some uh, remarks from you, Sergio. Um, and I can, I can just agree that uh, there is a risk that the uh, solidarity aspirations of the EU in general in the response to the uh, Russian uh, invasion and aggression in, in Ukraine and the uh, outflow of uh, uh, many displaced persons, this uh, solidarity aspiration may actually work to the detriment of the EU principles on rule of law. Not only uh, is uh, funding for the protection uh, of uh, displaced Ukrainians in the neighboring countries where there are many of them, indeed, not only are they being granted uh, with no conditions or conditionalities in terms of rule of law in general, uh, and it may be seen as even sort of implicitly uh, accepting uh, the, the, the wider approach to, uh, to border controls in countries such as Poland. But in addition to that, uh, there is also a risk, I guess, that the rule of law uh, mechanism that has been hardly won, uh, so to say, in the, in the wider uh, EU financial uh, instruments, in particular in the post-COVID recovery funding programs, that that may also be, be, be abandoned or modified, which will be a very significant cost for the EU uh, uh, values uh, in the longer and perhaps not so long term. So I agree fully that this is a particular aspect of solidarity, which is will be coming to, the, to, 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 be, to be tested here, really. Thank you so much. Let's move immediately to our next discussion, Julia Yofi. She's been patiently waiting. Julia, you have the screen, please. Hi, thank you so much. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited. And uh, I'm very sorry I'm unable to be there in person. But unfortunately, I'll have, I will have teaching in one hour. So <laughs> um, I wasn't able to come. So um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. And I'm conscious of uh, the time. Uh, also, uh, I would like to acknowledge, obviously, my bias. I, I am Ukrainian. So uh, I don't think I can be very objective uh, uh, about uh, a lot of of the issues. Uh, so uh, first of all, I wanted to touch on two points that were discussed and uh, particularly the point on solidarity. Um, and uh, I, and again, it's more comment and maybe question and more perhaps highlighting uh, the avenue for further research. I, I was just wondering whether solidarity at all uh, is discussed or researched in the context of diaspora and uh, migrant workers, uh, because uh, as I'm sure uh, all of you know, uh, there is a significant diaspora of Ukrainians in the neighboring countries. So Poland, uh, Czechia, all these countries have subst uh, substantial uh, diasporas of Ukrainians and the uh, Ukrainian migrant workers, some of whom, um, well, unfortunately work uh, illegally there. So it is difficult to uh, find out what exactly the numbers are. But I just wondered uh, whether there is any connection between and uh, between solidarity and uh, the existence of such a large uh, diaspora of Ukrainians. And maybe this could partially explain the difference in treatment of uh, Ukrainian refugees. Um, another point uh, that I wanted to touch upon is uh, um, visa-free regime for Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, I guess as a U Ukrainian who lived through this change of 2017, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. Um, Ukraine didn't have any sort of visa-free um, uh, uh, regulations with the EU countries, although Ukraine has direct uh, uh, borders with uh, a number of U uh, EU countries. Uh, and for 30 years, uh, there was uh, there were no special regimes. And uh, at least this is, again, like providing a little bit of political context, uh, the perception of, and I can't speak for all Ukrainians, but perception in Ukraine is that uh, this visa-free regime was introduced in 2017 as a result of uh, 
armed conflict in Ukraine that started in 2014. So annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass and uh, um, at least, uh, and, and again, I think that's how it's felt in Ukraine that uh, there has not been a lot of uh, political will uh, and solidarity in 2014 towards Ukraine. And uh, again, uh, around 13,000 people in Ukraine died uh, as a result of that war that started in 2014. So it's, at least politically, it has been perceived in Ukraine that uh, visa-free regime was granted by the EU uh, in exchange for the suffering of Ukrainian people. Um, and uh, uh, going back to, I guess, my, my main point that I wanted uh, to make before listening to all the excellent presentations is uh, um, talking about what Malcolm talked about is a paradigm shift. And uh, for me, my uh, the majority of my research concerns children and uh, children's rights to family unification and family life. And uh, I think that uh, um, it is a positive um, uh, development uh, that, for example, as, as I'm sure all of you know, that the Temporary Protection Directive includes uh, 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 an express provisions uh, on the right to family unification. And uh, uh, I think that uh, this is definitely a positive change because uh, I have been researching for years uh, the interpretations of family life and family to, uh, and the right to family unifications uh, by international courts and the human rights treaty bodies. And unfortunately, uh, many uh, treaty bodies and even courts do not think that there is a right to family unification in international law. So uh, I see it definitely as a positive uh, development. And, and again, uh, if we look at Article 15 uh, of the Temporary Protection Directive, uh, the definition of family life is also quite different from what we are used to. Uh, I, again, as I'm sure you all of you know, uh, in international law, we uh, usually uh, fall back to the core family uh, definition, so spouses, parents, and uh, underage children. But we can see that in temporary protection directive, there are also other relatives that can be considered for family unification. And again, we, we can see a parallel initiative. And of course, it's not temporary protection in the UK with the UK family scheme that uh, provides also family unification provisions, not only for spouses and underage children, but also other extended relatives. So. Uh, I think uh, generally, or at least I treat temporary protection directive as a potentially paradigm shift, not only with regard to temporary protection, but also uh, potentially as the right to family life, right to family reunification and definition of family. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, so we need to uh, start moving towards the closing of the panel, but I would like still to leave the opportunity to our presenters to respond or to briefly, really comment, very briefly, each of you, uh, to comment uh, back on the responses that you received. Uh, Eleni, you are closer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you uh, really for um, eye-opening and very stimulating comments. Um, I, I, I don't think that I could do justice to them, uh, but perhaps um, just two points. The first, um, as to um, the first question, whether you know um, the reception and protection of Ukrainians is it really a favor to Ukrainians? Um, and I think that um, this is what we try to also kind of argue with with our paper. Right? Is is it really solidarity to to Ukrainians? Uh, and uh, you know this was answered uh, that that it's basically a sophisticated form of containment, right? And, and I think that this is this is very, very powerful, and this is something that we need certainly to to continue thinking about. And basically, we argued that it was really a matter of convenience. I think Melton put it in in terms of you know political will. In that case, there was political will, but it was a matter of convenience. And I mean, realistically speaking, what could the EU have done differently? I mean. Could the EU have reimposed um, um, visa requirements? Let's say, right? could could it? I mean, again, another question. I, I, we don't we don't think so. At least personally, I don't think so. Right? I mean, and considering how the EU uh, wishes to also spread this idea of, of uh, uh, you know being the guarantor of human rights and fundamental rights in the region, right? Uh, and also, um, again, I also talked about this um, de facto solidarity sharing, right? It's basically the EU thing is counting right now on, on 
the diaspora that Julia uh, really, um, uh, like to the point that things spoke about, right? It's really diaspora that that will um, help in, in in these cases, and and uh, this is mentioned also in the the commission's um, communication. This generosity of diaspora taking or providing shelter themselves, like individuals uh, providing shelter themselves. So. Again, I think that this um, uh, this uh, speaks very much to our intervention, and also perhaps another uh, question that is relevant, I think, to the discussion about solidarity, is this distinction between law versus pragmatism. And I personally was always interested in what happens to solidarity when it becomes law, and this is something that. Um, um, Again, in, in a way, we hope that we try to convey this message that solidarity becoming law within a particular context of the former European asylum system, its rationale, um, and, and again, within this kind of alliance logic, has a particular implication of, of how solidarity is, is applied, right? And, and here I should certainly differentiate between EU solidarity and of course the solidarity that we see at the grassroots level, right? Solidarity by individuals to people and, and this kind of solidarity that back in 2015, I remind you that it was also criminalized, right? Um, the, the protection to particular migrants. Um, yeah, and, and then solidarity versus rule of law, um, definitely I think that, yeah, that there's, quite a lot to say here. I think that I certainly need to, to do some more research with that, but we certainly take on, on that uh, point. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Julia. Thank you. And um, thank you all for um, your additions to what we have uh, um, presented already. It's uh, amazing how many perspectives are united here in the, uh, today. Um, there's uh, a lot to say. I think I, I, um, I because I, I wrote my, my PhD thesis on on uh, mass migration governance and dealt with the topic of what is a crisis, what is an emergency, quite a bit um, in that regard. Um, and you also posed the, the question, why not use a different approach when there is an emergency? Um, and it also relates to the question of um, relabeling. Um, refugees um, or not. Um, I think it always depends on what you compare it to and what the alternative is. And um, yeah, you say um, what, what could have the EU done, but I think um, what we have seen, especially in emergency situations and in crisis situations, is that um, member states sometimes resort to means that they are actually not allowed to do and then use um, the emergency situation as a maybe not legitimate justification for that. Um, so I think using a different approach while respecting the human rights of the people coming um, is of course a legitimate approach. But if the alternative is closing our borders, um, which we have seen, then of course it cannot be uh, legitimate. Um, and I think we also need to distinguish um, what is a crisis in, in terms of time as well. Um, I think, um, that's not related to the topic here, but if we look at COVID, it's very evident that in the first weeks there was a complete crisis situation where nobody knew what was happening. Um, and then now we are still in somewhat of a crisis situation two years later, but it's much less chaotic, it's much more orderly, and we have had time to, to find different ways. And I think we can kind of um, transpose this, this concept also uh, when it comes to migration crisis. Um, yeah, and uh, regarding the labeling um, of refugees, I think we should not forget that there is a, a big stigma also around being a refugee, um, which I think, I mean, I can obviously not speak for Ukrainians, but um, uh, what I've heard is that people said they don't want to be a refugee, um, not because they don't want to have the rights um, under the convention, of course, but because they don't want to have the stigma, um, they want to find a way back to norm normality somewhere. Um, also, yeah, being allowed to go to school, being allowed to work, um, and yeah, finding a new meaning and finding self sufficiency, I guess. Um, and this is something that, as a, especially as I am seekers, um, don't always receive here in Europe. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Mentem, last words. Okay. I'll Can you join us? Sure. Because they will not see uh, you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I won't talk. Long. Okay.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists and, and the discussants because I learned a lot. It gave me a lot of food for thought as well. Um, one particular point, I think, because I have spent years on whether temporary protection practices undermine the 1951 convention or not in general, and the temporary, like whether temporary status leaves people in limbo. And um, my my answer to that, like for my subjective perspective, is that it depends on the maximum time limit. When you have a structured legal regime where you have common minimum standards and member states are obliged to provide at least certain and, and a quite cat, like decent category of rights as well, they're obliged to do it under ELO. And it is normally one year, can I only extend it to three years? Mm -hmm. I think most of the cases, although there might be some exceptional cases, this will not lead to undermining of the Geneva Convention. But in other countries, and um, South African example is one of them. I'm sure we will touch upon this in the second panel. It's like in Turkey, you have a temporary protection status going for 11 years. Or uh, when we talk about national statuses un unattached to massive fluctuations, like the US's temporary protected status, which I know has been implementing for certain nationalities, like Haitians, or, or more than 15 years sometimes. Yeah. So when you have uh, a temporary status with a certain limited rights for a decade or two decades, yes. That's uh, a very bad thing for uh, the protected persons. And I agree, this leaves people in limbo. Uh, Jim Hathaway and Alexander Neva have this really great article. It's like 100 pages, reconce Reconceiving Refugee Law. And what they suggest from social studies that five years should be the maximum, maximum limit of TP, because after five years, people integrate. And I'm not suggesting five years should be the maximum, but after five years, people will integrate and, and used to the country that they live in, they are very, very reluctant to go back on a personal level, not even the state. So I think the alternative was uh, of giving TP here was to let uh, all, the, all those fleeing Ukraine to apply for asylum. And you will have asylum seekers, for instance, two million applications that say in, Ukraine, uh, in Poland where the asylum capacity is, is not that great, like Germany, you know, that is not used to massive fluctuations. So I think the alternative will be millions of people waiting for asylum procedures for years, only will be able to get the rights and entitlements provided under the reception directive. And this will be quite a lower, lower standard. And of course, if the asylum applications can be processed really fast and they're giving international protection, that could be Great. In an ideal situation, prima facie international protection recognition might be the, the greatest answer. But for now, I think when we think about the realities and the, the, the challenges that Masterclass begins in the European context, just the European context, I think TP provides certain benefits to displaced persons. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to this wonderful panel and uh, to those of you who are uh, witnessing and uh, following us. Uh, I think we've learned a big deal of things. I've learned a big deal of things as well. Um, questions of, um, you know, I was thinking after five years, that's long-term residence status. <laughs> five years, that qualifies, should qualify someone for a long-term residence status. Um, so question of temporariness that they're uh, seeing from a different angle. And also I love the questions that we raised, as many of you, in terms of asking actually uh, to people, what does protection mean for them? What does protection mean for them? And the link with the this critique of solidarity as a strategy to immobilize uh, people and those who mobilize for them as well. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, we have now a smaller break <laughs> for the next one. If we, we had a question yeah. that actually was already addressed uh, indirectly by Jens. So thank you so much. It was about the issue in um, a financial support to countries like Poland and Hungary. It was indirectly answered by Jens. And we need to really close that uh, panel uh, at the moment. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we come back, uh, I would say, in 15 minutes. Yeah, in 15 yeah. minutes we come back. 35 past, yeah. Yeah, 35 past to, to continue with the second panel. Thank you. Uh, just housekeeping.
Uh, so welcome everyone. We are starting with panel two of uh, today's session on promotion of asyl forum on displacement from Ukraine and the activation of the Temporal Protection Directive. Um, we in this panel we wish to identify lessons learned from actually Turkey's experience with responding to mass influx situations. Um, as you all know, uh, Syrian arrivals uh, began in 2011. And Turkey has been implementing a national temporary protection regime and Syrians and uh, those fleeing Syria are eligible for to the temporary protection status in Turkey. And I think um, as a fellow Turkish academic and also I have been working with um, lots of different institutions over the years in relation to protection of refugees, I have realized that there is this vast experience that belongs to UN uh, agencies, institutions, um, civil society. And I think it is very important to identify lessons learned, how different institutions, including the government and, and UN institutions and civil society, have overcome some of the challenges that are associated with uh, responding to mass influx situations. But also it is important to, I think, um, identify good practices which could be replicated in certain, um, to, of course, to a certain extent in different contexts, in the context of displacement from <laughs> Ukraine and the temporary protection of Ukrainians in the EU. Uh, without further ado, I wish to give a uh, floor to Mr. Libor Plad, uh, the head of facility for refugees in Turkey, and um, he will be speaking about good practices and lessons learned from the tur uh, Turkish context. So, uh, Plad, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me just fine. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Libor Hlad, uh, and uh, uh, with my team, uh, we have been uh, implementing the facility for refugees in Turkey. Uh, I have been uh, myself in Turkey for uh, uh, for about three years now. So I can share indeed with you, it's with pleasure that I share with you my observations from, uh, from our work uh, in Turkey. Uh, as we all know very well, in the meantime, I will try to share with you a presentation that is, uh, that, uh, that is a good overview of our work. Let's see if it works. Um, what is happening? I hope I did not lose you. So in any case, uh, um, as you know, Turkey is hosting the largest, uh, it's not gonna work. Okay, uh, it does not matter. I think it will be more interesting even without the presentation. So the, as you know, the Turkey has been hosting the largest refugee community in the world. So indeed, uh, and the EU um, has put uh, uh, in place, has mobilized the, the largest uh, refugee response uh, to date uh, to address the challenges resulting from the massive influx of refugees from Syria to Turkey. So it's indeed an interesting laboratory of, uh, of, the, of the approach. And I think in many ways, as I will demonstrate in just a minute. Uh, sorry, but am I sharing my screen with you or not? Uh, because it's telling me I'm sharing my screen, but I cannot see the presentation. Can someone respond to me, please? We, 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 can see um, the we can see the screen, but it seems that you're sharing this. Uh, it says you started sharing the screen, but we cannot see anything. Okay, there is some uh, problem. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now we can see you. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, so you will have to bear with me. <laughs> so uh, indeed, uh, I think we have some interesting observations uh, from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, from this Turkish context of. Uh, of uh, refugee situation. Uh, I think the first thing that is fair to say is that uh, Turkey has been doing uh, a fantastic job in uh, hosting what is the largest refugee community in the world. That is uh, important. But the second thing to say is that uh, uh, what we have been, uh, we have been supported, the European Union has been supporting Turkey uh, in, uh, in hosting the, the, the Syrian refugees uh substantially financially uh, 
that has been done in the context of the EU uh, Turkey statement of 2016, as you all well, uh, well know. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the totality of 6 billion euro has been mobilized uh, under the name of Facility for Refugees in Turkey, which is a specific mechanism bringing together different funding sources, is the internal mechanics of how, how it works. But well, uh, one, uh, one thing is important there is that the, the money is coming from uh, two sources essentially, and it's on the one hand is the European, is the budget of the European Union, and on the other hand is the, uh, the, the contribution of the member states directly. So the member states uh, also have a stake. So it's a coordinated uh, joint effort of, uh, of addressing the refugee challenges. Under the facility, uh, the uh, internally it has been structured in two tranches. It's maybe of less interest. But what is important is that we have been working in a number of key priority areas. And these key priority areas, uh, you can guess for yourselves, uh, reflect, in fact, uh, the analysis of the group of the people that have been fleeing from the, from the Syrian conflict to Turkey. So they are, uh, about half of them are under the age of 25. Uh, so it's already evident, and they are coming from a, uh, from a situation of a conflict, so it's evident what is needed. So the, the two uh, first areas uh, of our work have been the area of health, provision of health care and, uh, and uh, protection to people coming from an area of conflict, and second, education, because, uh, as I said, uh, it's mostly people that are young and many of them are school-aged. So, and in these two areas, uh, to date, we have recorded, uh, I, I would say, a very good uh, rate of success. Turkey has uh, uh, succeeded in integrating very high, high percentages uh, of these young people into Turkish schools. If I could play the presentation, I would show you the, the numbers in more detail, but I can share the presentation with you later on. You will, uh, you will see, you would have seen that the, the, the rates of uh, enrollment of uh, Syrian children in Turkish schools are very high, especially in primary education. Uh, admittedly, they are, uh, they are uh, um, less good uh, uh, with the increasing age of the children. That means uh, uh, in the secondary and tertiary education, the numbers are, uh, are less good, which is, uh, there are different reasons for that. We have studied in detail, but partly is due to the fact that, uh, that uh, the pre-war situation in Syria was such that the uh, secondary education was not compulsory. So there are cultural reasons why this is happening. I can tell you that from my personal experience, I've also seen uh, Syrian children uh, or young uh, Syrian adults, uh, also girls, that were very thankful for the opportunity they received in Turkey to have access to education, and according, the, uh, according to their own statements, they had access to education that they would have not enjoyed in Syria had they stayed. So uh, it's just to some uh, food for thought. So education, we have been working directly with the Turkish Ministry of National Education that has been our counterpart and with a number of organizations to support our efforts in particular in terms of outreach to those that are still out of school. And we have to uh, be fair with ourselves and say that, uh, that there are still a lot of children that do not go to school, around uh, 400,000 according to our intelligence. So that is education. In terms of uh, healthcare, our ambition is, of course, to improve the general health status of the of the Syrian refugees in Turkey. Uh, that has been the case since uh, the facility was put in place back in 2016 and has not uh, changed dramatically to date. Although we have been reflecting, of course, the developments in the in the health situation and health needs of our target audience. So we have, uh, in particular, set up uh, around 200 uh, migrant health centers to complement the provision of health care uh, under the Turkish health system in the areas with high percentages of Syrian refugees, in, uh, uh, in particular in the big Turkish cities and also along the, the Syrian border, obviously. Uh, and in these uh, migrant health centers, 
we have uh, we have uh, employed uh, Syrian uh, medical doctors and Syrian uh, health professionals to provide primary uh, primary health care uh, to uh, their compatriots directly through Arabic which is an interesting concept because it solves a lot of problems. Uh, of course, uh, the obvious one is a, a problem of communication. If I had the presentation on the screen, you would have seen that. Uh, okay, the presentation is not... Uh, the latest data is not uh, entirely up to date, but you would have seen that there is, despite the fact that the, the, the Syrians have been in Turkey now on average for about eight uh, or eight and a half years, it's the average uh, figure, uh, there is still a high percentage of those that do not have uh, sufficient knowledge of Syrian to, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, Turkish to fully integrate into the uh, Turkish society. Uh, so uh, in the... Uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, an, uh, a horizontal problem in all the areas of our work, but uh, can be limiting the access of these people to, of course, public services, including healthcare, and in particular, and that is the, the latest uh, priority, is their access to the labor market, where the, without the language you cannot really move ahead easily. So. Uh, but uh, in, uh, I think in, uh, in general, I can say that provision of the healthcare has also been a success story. We have, uh, uh, we have increased uh, the access of, uh, of the Syrian refugees to healthcare, uh, targeted healthcare, and we have also used the capacity of, the, of their compatriots that have had health education from Syria and employed them in these migrant health centers. These migrant health centers, the idea is that they will progressively be, of course, fully integrated into the Turkish health system and that uh, the, the capacities will be taken over uh, by the Turkish authorities and, uh, and built, up, up, uh, built up on. So that is the, um, the health success story. And, uh, uh, there are also several other distinct areas. One is the area of uh, infrastructure, which sometimes we do not consider a substantial sector because we have been investing in infrastructure across the board, uh, also in education and health. So we have been building uh, schools for the, for the refugee, uh, uh, to enable the refugee children to integrate the, the, the Turkish uh, education system. Uh, I need to make an important caveat here that we have not been building refugee schools, as sometimes is uh, the comment that um, you can hear, but we have been uh, uh, creating conditions so that uh, the children uh, from the, of the Syrian origin can integrate uh, Turkish educational system and can participate in a, in a meaningful way in the, in the education process. We have also been investing in uh, setting up the migrant health centers and we will soon, in fact, um, in, uh, in about one month, we will inaugurate uh, or bring into operation two big hospitals uh, uh, with, a, with a, the capacity of several hundreds of beds, one in Kilis and one in Hatay. These, um, these two uh, Turkish cities are uh, among those that have the highest, uh, um, uh, highest uh, representation of, um, of Syrian refugees. Uh, in Kilis is over 70%. So you can imagine uh, the, uh, the challenge that it presents for the local community. So, uh, but also we have been investing uh, in, um, in municipal infrastructure uh, to help the uh, the host uh, uh, the host uh, communities to cope uh, with the sudden uh, increase of the population because obviously if the municipal infrastructure was not initially dimensioned for uh, for the number of people that are currently living there there is a high risk that the, the that the quality of the public service could deteriorate so that is uh, another area where we have been investing uh, a lot of money from the facility for uh, refugee assistance. And uh, now lastly, I will keep it short, then I think the discussion will be more interesting. Uh, uh, the last area that I want to talk about, and that has already been uh, also uh, mentioned during the previous panel, is the area of livelihoods or uh, 
uh, we call it socio-economic support, uh, when we say that we essentially uh, talk about creating uh, gainful opportunities, whether it's employment or self-employment for, uh, for the people under the under the temporary protection for the for the Syrian refugees uh, that have been living uh, in in Turkey for many years and that uh, of course are hoping uh, to uh, regain uh, an active con control of their life and provide for themselves and their families. Uh, while we of course have programs in place to support those that are uh, unable uh, for whatever reasons to provide for themselves and their families, uh, such as uh, the famous ESSN program. I wanted to show you the Kuzulai card, which is the, the token, uh, I think uh, I see you are nodding, is the token, uh, is a very famous card that we have been uh, using in cooperation with uh, Kuzulai that has been uh, our partner in implementing this, uh, this large uh, cash distribution program to uh, to make sure that these people will have at least uh, the bare minimum uh, to survive in, uh, in their uh, difficult uh, situation. But of course, it's not an ideal solution to put people on uh, subsidy programs. It's much better to help them uh, to uh, integrate in the labor market. And this is what has now uh, recently been uh, becoming increasingly important. I will not uh, hide away that the situation has worsened, as uh, you can guess, uh, as a result of the of the COVID pandemic, uh, many of the informal, uh, small or uh, odd jobs in the economy have disappeared uh, during the, the pandemic. And this has hit particularly harshly all the vulnerable groups, including the, the refugees. And uh, so um, there is a lot of work uh, to be done ahead of us. Uh, with regard to the access, because uh, as I said before, uh, we have ensured that access to the uh, to the healthcare system, access of the children to the educational uh, system, with regard to access to the labor market, is principle uh, there, but is uh, subject to certain uh, conditions, uh, including uh, issuance of a work permit that in Turkey is. Uh, not granted to the to the actual employee, but is a permit that is granted to the employer and is uh, that is bound to a particular job. So you can already understand that there are certain limitations for the for the uh, for the opportunities uh, for these people. So uh, I, uh, I two things I want to say to conclude this short intervention, and then I am very happy to join a debate is first of all uh, we are not uh, yet where we want to be so uh, you may know that last year the european council has adopted uh, another uh, three billion uh, continued uh, financial assistance for refugees in turkey we have been adopting progressively the concept of uh, one refugee means that people coming from any uh, conflict uh, essentially are in the same precarious situation and uh, need help. So we don't uh, uh, we don't uh, necessarily differentiate uh, between uh, people coming from Syria or from another place, uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, not fully in line with their legal status in uh, in this country. So you may know that uh, the Syrian refugees enjoy in Turkey a specific, I would say a privilege, even though it sounds a bit funny in this uh, context, but a privileged uh, legal situation of temporary protection, uh, which is distinct uh, from, um, from international protection or uh, from the refugee status uh, in general. Uh, and grants them uh, facilitated access uh, to, uh, to a number of uh, public services that I have mentioned. So, uh, but uh, there are limitations and uh, was interesting to hear during the preceding discussion that these limitations have been mentioned by the preceding speaker as well. So the, the, I think the gist of the te temporary protection is the, is the very issue here. What is, the, uh, is important to contemplate? What is temporary protection? There are limitations. Uh, first, uh, there is a, the, the temporary aspect. So there is a limitation in 
time. Second, there is a geographic limitation because on the arrival to Turkey, the Syrian refugees are registered in a specific province. And although opportunities are foreseen for them to re-register somewhere else, this is not automatic and is not always easy. So there is also a restriction on, if I can put this way, on the mobility of these on the free movement uh, of these people within uh, within this country no and then lastly of course is the substantial uh, the meaning of the temporary protection while temporary protection is uh, I, I would say uh, uh, or we can argue is a sufficient uh, response to an immediate uh, situation of crisis is protection is acceptance of some sort it uh, may become it may we may uh, we may reach its limits uh, when the when the situation is protracted and lasts uh, on on uh, and lasts on years and years because then of course people the, or at least we would uh, hope that the people will be able to uh, to put roots in the soil regain some control of their life and become autonomous again uh, and integrate in the whole society and this is the biggest uh, challenge that we are facing so under the new funding that was adopted uh, last year we are of course looking now in uh, moving ahead also with in line with the recommendations of the midterm evaluation of the facility that was uh, that was um, uh, delivered uh, mid last year and was presented widely to general public there are some very good recommendations some of them i've already mentioned uh, and Along these lines, uh, we are looking to work closely uh, with, the, with the Turkish uh, competent authorities in addressing uh, some of the challenges and bottlenecks uh, <clears throat> and, and increasing the efficiency of, uh, uh, of our assistance uh, to these people. So I will stop here and uh, remain available for any potential questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hart, for uh, identifying some good practices and good collaborative projects to improve access of uh, Syrians in Turkey to education, health and social care, but also pointing out that it has become a protracted situation and we need perhaps new solutions or adapted solutions for uh, this new challenge. Thank you very much for joining us online. Uh, so our next speaker is from uh, Ms. Nur Özkut. She is a deputy director of the Refugee Rights Turkey, a very active um, CSO uh, working in migration and refugee protection. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody, once again. Uh, so um, I also would like to start by thanking the organizers of this of this convention and especially Manta uh, for bringing us together at, at this very stimulating set of discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I represent Refugee Rights Turkey, a multi-jacular magazine in Turkish. Uh, this is an NGO headquartered in Istanbul. Um, I would like to um, briefly mention our work to give you an idea as to what kind of vantage point I'm, I'm speaking from. Uh, my organization uh, is uh, specialized in the legal protection of, of refugees and vulnerable migrants uh, for about 20 years. Uh, we provide uh, direct legal assistance services for refugees and, and um, uh, vulnerable migrants all around Turkey. Uh, we also uh, target Turkish lawyers, especially lawyers affiliated with uh, state-funded legal aid scheme. Uh, in different ways through trainings, through um, case law compilations and case support. And we also, of course, engage in policy advocacy as, as a civil society organization, mostly again in, in issues of rel relevance for uh, legal protection. Um, actually, I, I also um, want to thank you once again uh, to Matt Devonham uh, for having us uh, the opportunity to reflect on our experiences uh, as to like 20, 11 years into this is mass in, mass uh, displacement situation. Uh, we don't get to find a lot of time to reflect on uh, our experience, which, uh, which is very important. So it's difficult to actually uh, wrap up uh, the whole story in, in a couple of minutes. But uh, I would like to, uh, I, I will be uh, selective, uh, but I'll, I'll be mentioning some of the good practices and some challenges, uh, which I think have not been mentioned so far. Um, 
or, or maybe uh, good to uh, recap once again. Um, so one of the, um, so starting with good practices, uh, we all know that with the quick escalation of the war in Syria back in March 2011, uh, early April 2011, Turkey did not hesitate to um, define the situation as a mass influx situation and uh, responded to it with an open border policy allowing hundreds of thousands of individuals escaping from war and persecution to cross the border uh, and arrive safely uh, in Turkish territory. Um, so this is this must be acknowledged as a good practice uh, from the onset. Um, so open border policy, no forced deportation, and access to basic rights and services were the three publicly pronounced um, pillars of the de facto protection. Uh, that was made available for protection seekers uh, fleeing Syria back then. So we observed that um, these three pillars were mostly complied with until um, the arrivals reached some steady levels, um, mostly. Uh, and in terms of access to rights and services, um, it's noteworthy that Turkish government did not come up with parallel systems uh, exclusively that designated for protection seekers. So uh, mostly uh, Turkish government aimed to integrate services such as healthcare, legal aid, social assistance, uh, delivery uh, for, with already existing government infrastructure. Uh, one exception that was already also mentioned by Dijidahan yesterday was education. Uh, so uh, there were like Syrian schools and temporary education centers specifically designated for Syrian students which was also eventually discontinued uh, and integrated into existing national education infrastructure. Uh, so uh, we think that relying on reliance on these existing infrastructure and thereby expertise and building on this expertise uh, made it possible for more integrated and sustainable service delivery. Um, another good practice I would like to note here is the um, formation of a significant community of legal practitioners specialized in, 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 in uh, law uh, on foreigners and international protection and, and all the other legislation of concern for, for Syrians. Uh, it took some years uh, and the concerted efforts of, of the bar associations of UNHCR and other UN agencies, IOM here, uh, and organizations like us, Refugee Rights Turkey. Uh, though um, we should still uh, keep in mind that there's of course still an ongoing discrepancy between the actual needs on the ground in terms of quality legal representation uh, and what is uh, available. And in terms of another good practice, um, I also would like to mention uh, about uh, the change in the approach of the donor community. Uh, Mr. Halat also mentioned uh, the adoption of uh, one refugee policy, um, which uh, was not in place in the beginning. So there was a lot of focus on the donor agency with few exceptions, I should say, uh, on exclusively uh, supporting Syrian refugees. Uh, but this has changed and this was a good practice uh, that should be noted. And uh, the approach of one refugee policy and thereby addressing the needs of other protection seekers and also the host community through the funds made available for the donor community did not only help uh, address those needs of other community members but also uh, we believe mitigated some potential inter-community conflicts um, this way so uh, i also have some challenges to mention of course um, so the main legislative piece uh, that gave the details of the content of the so-called temporary protection regime, uh, the TPR, Temporary Protection Regulation, um, came in effect in October 2014, uh, exactly three and a half years later, uh, the start of the mass displacement from Syria to Turkey. Uh, and long after the actually um, start of the use of temporary protection reference by the government officials at the time. So everybody was talking about temporary protection, but what actually it meant uh, in terms of the you know, content of it, its eligibility criteria and the rights and services it's, it gave, uh, uh, it made possible. Uh, so it came only three and a half years later. So this was, this was a difficulty. 
um, especially for um, rights advocates and of course uh, refugees themselves to, to uh, claim those rights. Um, and here I would like to also note that, um, I mean, there's no time to go into the details, but the actual, the, the current migration and asylum system in Turkey and the backbone of it, which I mentioned to be law on corners and international protection was also adopted uh, later uh, than uh, after Syrians started to arrive in Turkey in April 2013. And the relevant migration agency was also formed after Syrians started to arrive in Turkey. So we need to uh, read all of these uh, in the back uh, with, with this background uh, to, to, to be, I don't want to say to be fair, but to, to make a better sense of the situation. Um, one other challenge we observed was the reliance at times by the government officials on not for public circulars instead of um, public cir uh, circulars or regulations. Um, when it comes to, when it came to certain key aspects of the implementation of the temporary protection regime, for example, uh, the, the, for instance, the later abundant pre-registration stage, the details of which was only uh, regulated through uh, not for public circular or uh, the details of the, 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 you know, the investigation that is being carried out for re-registration uh, situation under temporary protection still still regulated through not for public circulars. So this also made it very difficult for rights advocates to um, and, and refugees to navigate through the relevant procedures. Um, registration itself uh, was not always very straightforward uh, and the procedures have changed a number of times. An indication of some shortcomings of capacities and planning on the part of uh, migration authorities um, registration is key, of course, for refugees to access rights and services, but also for the government to understand who is in Turkey and their needs and their vulnerabilities. So um, to remedy this, uh, in 2016, a verification exercise has been started uh, by migration authorities with the technical assistance of UNHCR as well. Um, but uh, to date, there are issues about registration and even like simple clerical mistakes or, or mistakes about the transliteration of names co are causing and have caused so far serious access problems. And finally, um, mentioned in the early um, session as well, um, in, in our version of TP, uh, TP regime, there is no time limit. Uh, and it's presumed to be in effect until it's repealed by the head of executive power. Uh, and when I was listening to Professor Khan uh, this morning, I was like, okay, so we may just wake up a day and find ourselves that there's no uh, need for temporary protection anymore. Um, so the regulation actually offers us some guidance as to what can await us in that scenario. So either an individual assessment can be made for Syrians or a, some sort of prima facie uh, status or residency option can be offered. But um, I mean, the lack of any possible long-term naturalization option in TPR, say in the scenario if the war in Syria is prolonged, which exactly is the case, uh, effectively caused uh, three and seven million Syrians to um, live in this limbo situation, raise their children in this limbo situation. Um, in the meantime, some critical developments have occurred, uh, which is that the, um, according to the official statements, some 200,000 Syrians uh, were offered Turkish citizenship by Turkish government uh, on an exceptional ground, uh, meaning based on some sort of government discretion uh, through a, a very non-transparent process, we should say. Uh, which raised a lot of questions on the part of community members, Syrian and others, but also on the part of the Turkish public opinion. So, um, and finally, there is no officially endorsed integration plan for TP status holders, uh, and the prospect of having one uh, in the future looks quite dim in the current politicization of the asylum and migration matters uh, in Turkey. So. Here's a, I hope, a not so long summary of some of the issues uh, that I wanted to raise uh, from a non-governmental organization point of view. Thank you.
Thank you, Nero, for uh, identifying the challenges and good practices. I think what uh, Turkey experienced following 2011 shows us uh, the evolution of challenges uh, that mass influx begins. So in the short term, in the beginning, it's always registration. And in the case of Turkey, it what has to be, I'm sure it will elaborate on uh, re-registration and the verification of the first registration records. Mm -hmm. And it is very important to emphasize we need cred credible data, updated data on how many people are there in a country. And the EU now, I think, faces a similar challenge because in terms of data protection, Temper Protection Directive has Annex 2 uh, in relation to registration and the Commission in its operational guidelines uh, do not wish member states to collect more data. But in the long term, to tailor projects to improve access of the displaced communities to education, to healthcare, you need to know how many people are there, how many are children, how many need special care. I'm sure uh, our next speaker it will elaborate on that point perhaps then uh, identify more uh, lessons to be learned from practice um i uh, leave it to introduce themselves and uh, talk about the experience the floor is yours thank you very much Madam, and <clears throat> thanks once again to you to miriam to sergio for making this and the whole SL project team for making this event possible and making me a part of it too and i would like to also thank all the speakers and for their extremely valuable inputs for these two days. Uh, so and I actually want to thank you more specifically because you know it's a very ambitious job task to talk about lessons learned from the last 10 years in 10 minutes. Yeah, we have like a minute a year. <laughs> so well, Noor covered so good the good practices and also the challenges, but I will be focusing more on the bad practices actually and uh, what we can learn from these bad practices, not necessarily bad practices, but also some gaps and shortcomings that were amended in the process, but were also most of the time significantly costly. Uh, so my name is Yiğit Kader. I have been working in the asylum field in Turkey for the last 10, 11 years. For the first half of it, I was working for UNHCR for most of it uh, in provision of technical assistance to the government in the drafting of the new law, new foreigners and asylum law, and the establishment of the new asylum institution. After that, I briefly worked for the, the FCO in coordinating the migration funds in Turkey in their migration funds. After that, I worked for ICMP as a project manager in the asylum field. I did say that because uh, I ended up having a perspective uh, or experiencing the perspective, having the chance to experience the perspective from both the government side, from the international organization side, and also from the donor side. Uh, so in some of these points that I will be mentioning, I may be adopting more of an approach of an IO of, of an international organization or a government, or government organization. Uh, so be aware of that. So registration, yes, we concluded with registration and Matam also mentioned registration. Registration is actually was and still is one of the biggest issues that we have faced. In the, in the, in the, in the beginning of the Syrian mass influx in 2011, uh, up until we can say, I guess, 2015, uh, when the new asylum authority actually became fully operational with its with its uh, provincial extensions, branches. We actually had several institutions doing registration without integrated systems and without a uniform uh, registration approach. So this actually uh, provided us with what? With uh, unmatching registrations, tons of duplicate registrations, erroneous registrations, uh, and registration data that actually inform do not match each other. And this, as Noor also pointed out, created significant problems in terms of planning service provision and at the core of it in the government, in the protection actor, knowing exactly what kind of a responsibility for what kind of a population they have. So the issue is actually, although there are of course still ongoing shortcomings, here and there, but the issue was largely uh, solved during this two-year massive re-registration or verification uh, pro 
project intervention uh, that the government institution, the PMM, or the, as the asylum institution, let's say, the Turkish asylum institution and UNHCR implemented together. It was a massive effort. Almost 3 million people were re-registered. Uh, this also included not only creation of uh, uh, coordination mechanisms for uniform registrations, but also better identification of vulnerabilities as well. So the registration data collected was actually enriched with additional vulnerability data. Uh, but this was costly, as I said at the beginning. This was costly not only in the sense of financial cost or human resource cost or uh, any other material cost, but this was also uh, costly because in these two years, in 2017 and 18, Turkey actually received more than 100,000 asylum applications by non-Syrian asylum seekers. And less than 1% of them could be decided on by the asylum authority because most of the most of the resources, including the human resource and the case workers and whole institution basically was focused on the re-registration. And we can arguably say that Turkey actually still suffers from this massive caseload of asylum applications that are waiting. These are non-Syrians, Michael, not Syrians under temporary protection. So these two lessons, let's say, with regard to registration and identification of vulnerabilities as early as possible and realization of registration, proper registration as early as possible, in my opinion, are one of the, are two of the most important lessons for the immediate term. But they do have, of course, long lasting uh, effects and results, but these should be addressed in the immediate term. Uh, additionally, also the language barrier or the, the interpretation capacity is, of course, an issue that we have faced from the very beginning of the, of the let's say, mass influx situation. Uh, because as you can imagine, I mean, this is quite straightforward, actually, in terms of what kind of disadvantages this demand holds. It basically affects everything from registration to provision of any services or access to rights as well. Uh, so in terms of solving this issue or eliminating this barrier, well, there may be different solutions or there may be different approaches. Uh, Community-based interpretation may be one of them, but of course this comes with significant concerns in terms of in the, in the area of international protection. But still, although it limits it significantly, the potential it doesn't completely uh, eliminate it. So it should still be tapped, in my opinion. So as you can see, actually, most of the lessons, I mean, the, the ones that I have mentioned so far and the ones that I will be mentioning, in three words actually can be summarized as do, don't be late for informers. Don't be late, basically, for everything. Of course, I could also, you know, as Nur did, I had the chance not to do that, but we should, of course, focus on the good practices. But when we look at the good practices, we don't really, well, or we may actually ignore the timing of these interventions in terms of their effects. So when something is good, it's good. We all know that. But can we really judge that it actually worked because it was initiated as early as possible? So anyhow, I don't have much time, so I have actually spent already half of it. So in terms of local integration policies uh, and actually the communication strategies, communication policies as well, this actually, these, these points are borrowed from another uh, valuable colleague's work, Onur uh, Arenar, who wanted to be here but wasn't able to. Uh, in terms of local integration and communication, as Noor and also other speakers mentioned, we are actually right now facing an issue of high politicization, politicization of the issue and a very strong anti-refugee rhetoric sentiment. And this is an ongoing process. We haven't reached the end of it. So whatever I will be seeing, what we will be saying here, there are lessons coming, additional lessons. And I'm afraid these will be more bitter lessons. But in terms of you know, addressing these, these issues, uh, the local integration policies should be developed and implemented as early as possible. And they should be developed in a, in a process, in an in a, uh, inclusive process. Uh, they should be developed with a little bit long-term projections as well, and should be transparent and open to public debate from the first day. 
Now, why, why do I feel the need to underline this actually? Because you know, when we are talking about temporary protection, this, this element of temporariness actually creates well, all kinds of issues that we have discussed here, that the other speakers uh, rightly discussed here. But in terms of integration, well, what, what, what are we looking at then? Should we wait until the temporariness actually goes away so that we can start integration? Or should we uh, should we implement different implementation procedures, uh, different different inter uh, okay. integration measures until well during the time of this temporariness? But the way I see it, the way I see our lesson from here, what that was, we were late. Tur I mean, Turkey was late in developing implementation uh, integration measures and the process that they were developed in could be much more transparent and the communication part of it was i have to say until very recently largely ignored and com uh, communication is a the development of a of a comprehensive communication a policy strategy and implementation of it with a, with a wide range of actors is actually including both the government actors and the NGOs and international actors it should be utilized as much as possible in order to in order to address the as I said politicization of the issue but also the anti-refugee rhetoric that eventually and maybe unavoidably emerges after some time. I'm saying this because we actually, this is a recent issue. Some claim otherwise, but in Turkey, we actually have seen turning of a very positive approach of a very warm welcome into a negative sentiment, negative rhetoric, especially in the recent years. And could this be addressed with communication? Well. We can never, but with better communication, we can never know without trying. Yeah, but this is this is a general lesson actually, which can be implemented in many of the uh, refugee situations. But in temporary protection, in the in the context of temporary protection, I actually would like to uh, say or add an additional element there. I think in the context of temporary protection, and I am still saying this, uh, looking at the situation in Turkey. I think any communication strategy should also include an element where it explains what is actually temporary and temporary protection to the host community, or actually even to the institutions, to the public institutions as well. I'm not talking about exposing the public to deep legal debates about temporary protection or what temporary protection is, of course. What I'm saying is that protection being provided through a, te through a temporary mechanism initially, doesn't mean that the need for protection is temporary or the needs of these people are temporary. Because right now, most common rhetoric, the most common elements of the rhetoric we're seeing right now in Turkey is these people, quote unquote, are temporary anyway. Yeah, they are not refugees, their protection needs are temporary, so they will, they can, and they will, and they should return. Okay? So in turn, and this is not only the public we're talking about. As I said, I'm actually I actually really doubt that the public institutions, most of them, does really realize what is really temporary, temporary protection. Anyway, I'm running out of time, so I will be faster. So uh, two minutes. Okay. So with regard to label market integration and self-reliance for basically any kind of inter integration actually or social inclusion, yet we should be aware of the structural pro problems that we may be faced that are inherent in the country and that may affect our intervention. And looking at the labor market integration, we actually discussed yesterday about the informal labor market and how this still is a huge problem uh, and actually even getting normalized in a sense in Turkey. And this has roots in the structural uh, problems that are already uh, existent in the, in the country. And this has an effect on access to education, on access to health, 
uh, on access to social services, basically access to any kind of rights or provision of any kinds of services. What, uh, one, other, one other thing that we have seen is that in the current situation in EU, in the EU, it's in temporary protection, I actually believe that this is uh, even more, uh, it should be even more underlined. Even inter-institutional cooperation should not be taken uh, for granted, let alone intergovernmental cooperation or coordination. And even in the provision of basic services, we had significant problems in terms of, and many due to the actually uh, regulations being late or not being, uh, as Norm mentioned, transparent as they could be. So uh, assuring or ensuring coordination among institutions should be actually to the lowest detail as possible, in my opinion, a part of the initial planning of the interventions. So as I said, and one last thing, I'm sorry, and this wasn't actually among my uh, initial list of lessons learned, but uh, Professor Kahn's uh, contribution actually made me think about it. Uh, I would love to discuss here what temporary protection is, and there are different definitions, but ultimately how I see it, or how we can actually see it when we look at the Turkish regulation or the TPD. This is basically a temporary, an extraordinary mechanism to provide protection until the regular, the ordinary protection mechanism can be functioning, fully functioning again. This may be due to lack of resources, this may be due to prioritization, this may be due to high numbers of people, but ultimately this is a temporary mechanism to provide protection until the ordinary, until the permanent mechanism can be functioning again. So this transition actually is very important to be planned. And in Turkey, we actually, yeah, we didn't see the end of TP yet. I don't know when we will see it, but if we see it in the short term, are we ready to process the cases in on an individual basis or on a group basis? Are we ready to provide, a, are we ready to recognize the status on group basis? Do we have the operating procedures for that? Honestly, I don't know, but this should be one of the priorities in the long term at least uh, to be planned. I'm sorry, I exceeded my time for well, four minutes. <laughs> but, yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, really raising a number of important, I think, lessons that uh, intercommunication is really important for government institutions. We see that the late action being taken and late legislations cause a lot of harm for many displaced persons and sometimes this was intentional but sometimes this was just that um, it took time to get things done in government institutions and because of that we have seen for instance the right to work given in 2016 only after four to five years after the initial mass influx begin and in my personal opinion this has caused really quite a lot of uh, serious to plea to other countries because they weren't able to find jobs in, in legally in Turkey and this was something that could be easily precluded and, and with a regulation being adopted prior to, for instance, 2014. But uh, that is the reason I think we are doing this panel. So I think Neet is quite right in a sense that communication, not just between governmental or in different institutions, but also informing the public about the statuses, the protection needs, and which groups may need international protection as opposed to those uh, others. It's quite crucial to also lead a correct way to uh, discuss the matters. So uh, without further ado, I wish to give floor to um, to our two representatives from IOM. So we have uh, in the program, as you can see, Zeynep Pilara Barbarolo, but also Emine Marmar Karayat will also join her. And uh, you can um, present yourself better than me probably. So I'm giving the floor to you. Hello everyone, and uh, this is Emine. Uh, I am working uh, at the IOM for nearly six years, and I am a national program officer under the Immigration and the Border Management Unit. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for this opportunity, especially for Mantan Hocam, to be a part of this workshop and convey my 
uh, gratitude to all panelists and discussants for their beneficial contribution. Uh, and uh, I'd like to touch upon some uh, IAM's response to the missing flags from Syria to Turkey about programs and projects relevant to temporary protection region and uh, briefly on cross border initiatives. Uh, then my colleague, our legal uh, officer, Vlada, will compile uh, the key lessons that we are, uh, we are able to derive from our presence and observation from field, and of course, from our experience working with the governmental bodies and other related stakeholders. Uh, besides provide, uh, providing support to governmental institutions to develop national action plans and strat strategic normalization, I am also is enhancing stakeholders' capacities and maintenance well-being under four main strategic uh, subjects in Turkey. One of them is cross-border operations, refugee response pro uh, rest, uh, program is second one, migration management and the resettlement programs. Uh, and I am Turkey's main activities uh, specifically for the Syrian nationals in Turkey. Uh, we could mention uh, the refugee response activities, including cash base aids and the school bus for the children and uh, psychosocial support. And the other one is the cross border assistance, and uh, this one is uh, decreasing nowadays due to the uh, educate, near education since the city of New has happened. And uh, the Mediterranean response activities is there, including search and rescue operations in the Mediterranean. Uh, these are the main uh, areas, main activities for the uh, Syrian nations in Turkey. And uh, moreover, I am uh, gave support to Turkish uh, government facilitating inclusion of unemployed uh, Syrians into the labor market. For example, I am gave support to the uh, Turkish government to drafting regulation on work permits for foreigners under temporary protection, which was uh, adopted in 2016. And the social cohesion and uh, harmonization process are the also uh, IAM's other uh, main mandate in Turkey for the Syrians and Nations program. And now I yield the floor to the Dilara. Thank you, Emine. And um, thank you all for this kind invite and for uh, this important workshop. And thank you all panelists and discussants for your kind contribution. I really learned a lot from you. Um, so about lessons learned from Turkey's response to mass influx and also Turkish practices on temporary protection, uh, I believe all points were raised by the panelists, so thank you for that. I'm going to just uh, summarize our point of view. Um, access to territory, I think, is the first thing that we should discuss. Uh, so we divided this topic into three subheadings uh, for early stages of mass dis uh, displacement situations for states. So first, access to territory and border management. Second, the reception conditions. And finally, provision or recognition of legal status to migrants. Um, about uh, the access to territory, as many speakers already pointed out, it should be provided to all without any discrimination, of course. And border management policies and strategies and practices should be implemented uh, in a gender sensitive and age sensitive manner. Um, and again, Early detection and identification of vulnerable individuals and referrals to necessary protection mechanisms are uh, crucial in this early stages. So border officials, migration authorities, law enforcement officials, uh, any personnel working with the state should be well knowledgeable and educated on these matters. So states could be supported by international organizations or NGOs to train their personnel on gender and age sensitive matters. Um, available job legal assistance, medical and psychosocial social support at border points and three points, and provision of information to migrants about their rights, obligations, about domestic procedures such as application to asylum, application to residence permit, work permit, etc., should be provided at an early stage. And this could also prevent organized crime, uh, such as human trafficking and child trafficking. If they know their rights, they could speak up in a sense. Uh, special attention should also be given to recognition and provision of legal status at early points, as uh, mentioned by Yiğit Bey and Nur Hanım, uh, because this only uh, doesn't give them an identification or a 
way to be legally present at the territory, this also allows them to access to services such as healthcare, education, labor market. Uh, which brings us to the points we made uh, yesterday and today about Turkey's decision to apply temporary protection nearly after three years of uh, after arrival of the Syrian national, and the fact that the temporary nature of this protection is up to discussion, of course, after nearly a decade of them being here uh, under temporary protection. Uh, but it is also important to recognize that adoption of this temporary protection regulation and other legal instruments was a great step taken forward in compliance with international standards uh, by the Turkish government. Uh, and as Noor already mentioned, it is also important to note that temporary protection was made available to all persons fleeing from Syria, not only for Syrian nationals, but refugees, stateless persons, uh, residing in Syria, but able to benefit from this uh, protection. And uh, again, about access to services, as we already highlighted in her presentation, uh, TP beneficiaries are only allowed to benefit from their rights and services in their registration city. So Turkey is implementing a similar regime uh, as the satellite city program, let's say. So uh, temporary protection beneficiaries are expected to stay at their registration city to have access to those kinds of services but this might be a good practice in a view of the state because it avoids um, overload or build up at the service provider uh, point of view hospitals schools etc and finally we could say to say that turkey's response to migration flows their management of irregular migration and migration in general, their capacity of controlling the borders are getting better and better by time in face of these big figures. So again, I know that temporary protection is ongoing for a long time, but this also allows time for Turkish authorities to educate them, their, themselves, improve their response, and maybe have a better grasp of the situation given the time is being passed for nearly a decade, like I said. Again, thank you for this time and for this opportunity, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Laura and Emine. I think uh, IMS quite um, makes a difference in practice for the protection of asylum seekers, refugees, but also migrants in Turkey, because uh, the capacity building and the support they provide to legislation drafting is quite crucial, I think important. They bring an international perspective into uh, mostly national processes. So um, we have limited time. So I wish to give floor to uh, ne Ms. Neshe Kulunçoğlu from UNHCR Ankara office. Neshe, can you hear us? Hello, Merhaba Hocam. Hello to everyone. Yes, Merhaba. I think I can I can quickly start. And first of all, thank you very much for your kind invitation. And uh, I have been in listening to the other panelists who have also touched upon the main issues. So trying to avoid a reputation, I would like to say that I would simply answer in a very quick manner to touch upon five areas. I think these are the main, main lessons learned from the perspective of international refugee law and regime and also the international protection needs. So this is a very dynamic process. I think the biggest lessons learned on the side of Turkey has been that the, the challenges evolve and then the, the state will be seeing that in the first year of the temporary protection or arrival of the persons and the last years or the third year and fifth year completely showing different kind of challenges that the state should be really prepared. So um, my colleagues have also started touching upon these main issues, but I think my notes, I had also prioritized registration related issues. And then I think for all the countries, the registration of the personal data is quite important. It should be reminded that it should be collected in a very accurate manner. But this is not only because related to the programs or because of the planning or because of the other uh, kind of um, delivery of the services, but this is mainly very much important for the persons and in the future when it comes to the civil law related matters, when it comes to the establishment of the family composition, family ties and claiming the rights such as family unification and also in case of a tribal solution, including the voluntary repatriation to the country of origin to establish 
the documented relationship with the rest of the family members. So where it takes us, it also very much takes us to the fact that at the time of the initial registration, this family composition should be clearly uh, taken. The unaccompanied children, separated children should be accurately noted down. Family composition has been also noted down. Identification of the persons with specific needs, specific vulnerabilities, risks have already been touched upon by other panelists and we all acknowledge the, the importance of that. So um, we are talking about the Ukrainian situation and we all acknowledge that there's a coordinated response on the side of the EU member states. There's also an established procedural site and there are also established structures and the rules in that site. So um, I will not go into the details of what Turkey has suffered or what the experience has teached us because we have already went through the verification process and all of this. Uh, however, it needs to be, I think, kept in mind that yeah, yes, now we are talking about a situation where the country of origin of the sports placement may have some kind of a, a system established way to document its own citizens, but we may be coming and facing another kind of an forced displacement where maybe originated from other countries where such kind of systems are not in place. So it is it shifts on the side of the receiving country to make this kind of an arrangement on the registration and documentation. This is quite important in this respect. And when it comes to the rights, I think we all have touched what is important. And we have talked about a little bit of access to work permits, um, employment, talk about education, health. And we even, I am colleagues have touched on legal aid and legal assistance, we are, which are also quite fundamental in this kind of the crisis. But I think we need to also remember rights information. And this, this right to information is also quite essential, should be provided in the best manner and in a full accuracy and competency to the persons to make them well informed about their own rights, to make them claim these rights through the services that authorities are providing them, and also to avoid resorting to any kind of an irregular menace, including the exploitation or to the third parties, which may really propose such kind of services in return of some benefits. So this is also, I think, in the positive obligation of the state that they have to really make this kind of an uh, information sharing well-informed persons on there. And um, we always refer to the durable solutions and providing some kind of a long-term options to these persons. And um, the options are quite clear. We always talk about three main options, but um, I would like to look at this from a different perspective. It is, I think it has two layers. One is what the state authorities or states really offer to these persons who may have been not uh, having any kind of an option to go back to their countries, to re-avail themselves of protection of their own state. And as we have already recognized that either it is a refugee status or a temporary protection status, everything is temporary. So this temporariness should be replaced by, with a, a more permanent kind of a status and a durable solution should be proposed. So the states should be also looking from this perspective, even from the first year of the forced displacement, because um, the expectations on the side of the country is that this will be a short lived uh, conflict or it will be resolved in the coming days may not be necessarily the case. It may prolong, it may be really uh, extend more than it was expected or projected. So this readiness should be always kept in mind. But there is also another, I think, uh, pillar of that. The state should prepare themselves from their own asylum procedures, asylum system, meaning that, yes, we realize that this is a temporary status and we all hope that this instability, war, conflict in the country of origin will end one day. However, if it doesn't, then we need to come up with the status-related discussions and this is not to undermine the legal status and weight of the temporary protection. And at the end of my um, intervention, I will try to also remind that this is a legal status. And uh, this gives the rights, including the non refoulement rights. And um, however, if a state comes to a stage that at the end of this temporary protection period, which has been declared that this dribble solutions have not been possible for all, 
then there will be a need for an individual RST procedures. And the states should be able to strengthen their own, own national asylum systems in order to address such kind of RST processing of the high number of the persons. One last issue would be also again related to the solidarity and responsibility sharing. We all call for that. We know that this, this is not an, um, not an issue about one specific country. The neighboring countries receive the most of these cases and the forced displacement try to develop their own systems and responses. However, there is another, again, part of the solidarity and the responsibility sharing. It also has an effect on the public perception and the public opinion, because we, I think, have uh, witnessed in Turkey and in other countries where there's a protracted refugee situation, where the, where the states host a uh, big number of refugees for long years, there's an unavoidable fatigue that appears not only on the host society, but also on the services, on the system. So um, when the solidarity comes into picture, the this little bit elevates the pressure or the burden on the side of the state, but also it eases some kind of messages that is delivered to the public and the society. So the next thing that I really want to touch upon is also about the communication with our societies. And this needs to start since the beginning, and it should be established and founded on the right space approach, because the way that we deliver the temporary protection or international protection is because of the state's obligations under, interna under international law and per their nation legislation. Sometimes we see that this kind of discussions are hijacked by charity related discussions, social related discussions. This is quite important. This is a humanitarian uh, tragedy requiring humanitarian responses, but at the end and at the top of everything else, this is, under, this is a system that is regulated under international law. States have their own obligations. They accept these persons because they have committed so and because of non refoulement principle. So this needs to be really explained to the whole society so that this kind of discretionary approach, arbitrariness, this unpredictability in the responses or the system, or this risk of deportation of these persons back to their country of origin, this kind of stuff should be really prevented. And this anti-refugee sentiment is really avoided on the side of the public opinion, knowing that this is part of the legal system. Um, we talk about one last point maybe, is that um, we talk about temporariness and um, we, the states decided to declare the temporary protection because of some reasons. And this is mainly because of the numbers that are arriving, which make the individual RSTs, RSTs impractical. The states may decide to declare temporary protection based on the first reasons and stating that the objective grounds and facts in the country of origin does not require such kind of a detailed explanation. But this doesn't affect the nature and the status of the person who are escaping. This status is a declaratory status. So the states have already acknowledged that these persons are in need of international protection. And the temporary protection is given only because of procedural reasons, not because of the individual circumstances of the person. When we talk about persons under temporary protection, we are also talking about persons who would qualify as a refugee if he had gone through an individual RSD process. So all our discussions on the temporary protection should remind ourselves these facts. And then I think uh, this will also help us to, to make these kind of the policies and measures and responses in its place. I hope I didn't also exceed my uh, time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nesha. This was quite informative. And I think uh, what you said about solidarity fatigue is real, although the, or the initial approach is can be quite welcoming. And in the, in the case, in the European context, it may be that many member states are willing to accommodate and protect, but uh, once the years pass and this becomes, uh, and, and if the member state has indeed some economic problems, I think this becomes even more relevant issue that it is need to be, um, the states are, it is crucial that states get ready for uh, giving 
access to asylum procedures, but also durable solutions and think about it from the beginning. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, so our uh, the last discussant of today is uh, Ms. Gizam Ulic Karajlı from Council of Europe. Uh, Gizam, can you? Yes, I think we can. Hello, hi. Yes, hi, Hello. Gizam. Hello. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours and you can uh, please just uh, present yourself and continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, very glad to hear all the panelists speak and see a few friends and uh, former colleagues over there. And uh, thank you for your kind information on all the work uh, uh, that uh, pro it took to organize this event. And uh, my name is Gizam Ilic Karachla. I work for the Council of Europe and currently I'm coordinating the project on strengthening uh, the human rights protection of migrants in Turkey. And uh, this is a project, um, this is a joint project uh, of EU and the Council of Europe. Uh, and our ma main beneficiary is uh, the PMM, Presidency of Migration Management. Um, well, after all these like informative, informative briefings, uh, uh, I want to talk, uh, I want to talk mainly on two issues, um, briefly also touched upon uh, by colleagues. Um, in the context of our project, I'm going to refer to, I'm going to talk about this, these two issues. The first, the first one concerns uh, is um, legal protection, in fact, as referred, uh, as, as also mentioned by Noor. Um, in what well, Turkish example is very dramatic, uh, I, I think, uh, in terms of, uh, in, in this context, because we really didn't have a, any piece of legislation um, regulating the, um, uh, international protection or, or law and foreigners and then uh, and this was a huge challenge uh, however in 2014 and afterwards in, in 2013 and in, in 2014 uh, then uh, we had uh, the main pieces of legislation uh, the law and foreigners and international protection and temporary temporary protection regulation um, however uh, when you have uh, this this kind of a legal gap and we when you have this dynamic legislative pro process there will always be gaps legal gaps uh, that may that will pro uh, prevent uh, the upholding of rule of law respecting uh, law uh, proper implementation law and uh, unfortunately uh, always um, abiding by human rights standards uh, so I think uh, we see in Turkey, we saw in Turkey that a lot of challenges uh, in, in, in this context, but also uh, some good practices and a lot of hard work uh, to over overcome uh, those, uh, those, those challenges. Um, and I wanted to perhaps uh, give an example on alternative to immigration detention. Uh, you know, in, in, in Turkish legislation, we didn't have a norm on, alter on alternative to immigration detention. But last year, uh, the law was amended. Uh, so we see that challenge is being overcome. However, it's not perfect. And still, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, work uh, that is needed to be done. And uh, the international uh, organizations, such as Council of uh, Europe, for example, is supporting the government uh, in order to um, in order to overcome uh, the the shortcomings in the legislation around the implementation of 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 of, uh, of this new norm uh, that is now in in uh, law and foreigners and international protection, um, and I know that there's a lot of programming activities um, implemented by other uh, international organizations and and uh, perhaps NGOs. Um, I thought this is a good the, the, a good story of um, a challenge uh, remedied by some some good practices some practices according to me this is all all hard work uh, and ongoing um, but it concerns at the end of the day legal protection uh, and legal security uh, uh, and overcoming legal gaps um, for for uh, refugees and migrants effective protection the second issue that I wanted to talk about concerns capacity development. Um, in the when the authorities, I think, uh, face um, face this this kind of a mass influx situation, it is it is virtually impossible to be completely prepared for 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 this kind of a scenario. Uh, and um, at the end of the, the beginning of, of of the refugee influx into Turkey, everything was so new. The PMM was new. Uh, it was then called the DGMM. Uh, even I think the NGO of workers, even us, I was at that time working for the UNHCR in Gaziantep, we needed a lot of trainings. And so everyone needed a lot of support to do their work, I think, properly. 
Um, and uh, however, uh, the challenge, well, there was this huge challenge, and I think um, international organizations, NGOs did a lot, uh, a lot of work to support the government uh, on that, uh, uh, in, in, in that. Um, but the problem, well, the problem, uh, uh, let's say the problem with capacity development is that uh, it should be an ongoing effort. At the beginning of the crisis, at the beginning of this this uh, refugee influx, there, there was a lot of effort, but it still needs to needs to continue in Turkey. Um, and uh, Council of Europe uh, provides a lot of human rights based trainings for officers um, and also NGOs and lawyers, uh, in, also in the context of our project. Uh, one thing I wanted to I wanted to talk about is that um, when we uh, design and deliver trainings to support the government or our counterparts, our beneficiaries in the host country. It is vital for me to, uh, for those trainings to be designed um, with a human rights approach. Uh, because without that, I think uh, it, is, it is rather difficult to alter the practice, the day-to-day -day practice uh, uh, of, of, um, uh, of those who are implementing these rules and like, uh, very, at times very complex uh, rules and regulations in the field. Um, another challenge, and this is my last point, uh, concerning capacity development is uh, perhaps sustainability, um, because the funds uh, will, will um, diminish at some point, the interest uh, will diminish at some point in, 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 in a given uh, displacement situation. And uh, there's always new crises, there's always new, new um, emergency situations. Um, and for that, I think, in addition to giving trainings, um, um, resources that are already available to the council, to the international community, for example, Council of Europe has a lot of tools and 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 um, um, standards um, uh, to be translated and made of, make available to uh, to be adopted to the national context, uh, so that uh, the uh, authorities or um, uh, those involved in migration protection, CSOs, for example, could consult uh, to them uh, on their own. Um, this is uh, this is all um, I, want, I wanted to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kizam, for emphasizing the need for uh, ongoing capacity building and training of, of, of persons, actually, government officials and others, judges, lawyers, working with temporary protection beneficiaries, but also other asylum seekers and refugees. This is a substantial, important issue, and Turkey has been doing a lot of capacity building over the years. I can tell from my uh, first hand experience. Thank you very much for your contribution. OK, so we went over time, but I will first ask whether you have any questions in the room or if anyone online has any pressing questions. OK, we have two questions. Um, I hope you can hear us for this online participants and discussions as well. Okay. So the first one is Eleni. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks everyone for really informative uh, presentations. I, I learned a lot uh, from, from you. And I mean, my question relates to solidarity. Um, I mean, um, many of you mentioned that, and also uh, others implied, you know, we talked about capacity building, uh, resources, operational support, training. And I kind of wonder what. What would solidarity ideally be for Turkey? Um, what would be a kind of an adequate um, assistance to Turkey as, as a host country? Um, would, it, would it be, it's basically just money doing the job? Is, is kind of financial assistance the, the answer here? Um, if not, then what is? Is it with resentment? Um, um, and, and I mean, and I'm asking that because on the one hand, we have Turkey hosting so many refugees. On the other hand, we have Turkey agreeing uh, to, you know, to this uh, EU-Turkey agreement, which is according, you know, to, to uh, most commentators, uh, a responsibility sifting um, uh, instrument, not really a responsibility sharing instrument. So I kind of wonder, right? And, and I'm asking this because 
uh, also, I mean, I come originally from Greece, and, and I know that this Greece for many years was pushing, was asking for solidarity, right? But at the same time, it has accepted Dublin, the Dublin system, uh, and it kind of it has found ways to frustrate the system precisely because it was unfair. Uh, so I kind of feel that there is some some kind of a similar situation here. Um, and yeah, so my question is to what extent you have thought about that, what solidarity would actually uh, or how could it meaningfully contribute uh, to uh, the reception? Thank you so much to, to all of you um, for this fascinating panel. Um, my question relates to registration. So this is something that um, has come up in the conversation today and in other um, presentations yesterday, the focus on data gathering. And of course, my question relates to the impact on, on privacy and, and data protection in the sense of how can we ensure that um, registration as UNHCR registration is not constitutive, it's mainly certifying something that already exists. Um, so it has a very kind of service provision um, uh, nature, and yet we have a number of factors that are in, uh, in a central seat in registration, which come up from the border management, migration enforcement, even law enforcement communities. That have completely different interests. And I was wondering how to make sure that there is there a way to make sure that this data is not misused uh, by certain authorities? How can we make sure that this data is not accessed by authorities that do not have any uh, legitimate uh, take on, especially if we talk about personal data? For what uses, for what purposes is this data going to use? And more especially, how are we going to prevent that this data is shared with third countries? So, what are the guarantees um, that uh, exist? And when we call out for registration, how can we make sure that um, this is taken care of? Is there a way to do that? And if not, which guarantees then would we need to, you know, how we, do we need to perhaps think carefully when we say, we need registration. What do we need precisely? What do we need precisely for service provision? For people have, having access to rights? Just that. Just that. Okay, so um, we have Eleni's questions on solidarity and Sergio's questions on registration, data protection and privacy. I will give first floor to speakers and then I will ask discussant whether they have any comments. So mm -hmm. here. Oh, Mr. Claude. Um, sorry, Mr. Claude, do you want to uh, answer uh, in any of the questions? If you can hear us. Okay, if you want to just uh, respond to question, just let us know. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, well, about the, maybe I, I will be able to say something about the first question, not so much on the second question as um, use of data, private data or, or, or protocols by which data is uh, secured is, is not directly something I have a lot of thoughts on. Um, but the very first question, I think, I mean, and not, to, to answer your question, like what, what, what amounts to uh, solidarity with Turkey? Is it, is it financial solidarity? Is it alternative legal channels? I think it's a combination of, of, of some of these. And I, I uh, echo with what Nesha Hanum has said, like challenges are uh, dynamic. So uh, what would uh, have uh, been good solidarity uh, example five years ago may not be the same uh, as now. So definitely uh, to like, I mean, financial solidarity, alternative legal channels are, are two very constitutive uh, components of it. But um, I think like learning from like some good examples from, from other contexts as to what worked, what did not work. Um, 
may also be in the, you know another um, solidarity or or something to support the the context here and, and the protection seekers the capacities uh, here uh, is is something that comes to uh, my mind. Yes, thank you. First of all, with regard to registration, yeah, I was actually hoping to discuss it with you, Sarah. Well, I don't have any miraculous answer actually, because you know maybe there is a miraculous answer, and I am not able to give it because I'm not an expert in data privacy. Uh, but basically, this is a question that we are asking not exclusively in the area of temporary protection. No? This is in general because registration is a core part of the asylum procedure and principle of confidentiality in asylum procedures is key, one of the main procedures. So I actually don't see any reason to uh, consider this issue any differently compared to the general asylum context. But this, of course, doesn't mean that the TP context doesn't bring any additional risks with it mainly because it's an emergency situation and most well a lot of principles or safeguards within the system uh, may be under heightened risk uh, so my answer would be maybe boring but yeah my answer would be first of all ensure that the tp itself does not create any heightened risks in terms of data, uh, data protection uh, and on top of that well, basically regulating in a way which upholds principle of confidentiality and especially the information is not shared with third parties, especially, especially with the country of origin, of course. But other than that, yeah, it's... Well, we've learned the field of asylum is that once you have, once you have a database, you no longer control it. Mm -hmm. It becomes a creature, everyone has access, access to it, it becomes interoperable, and it goes to the detriment the people. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what we know in the field of asylum. Mm -hmm. And for these advices. What I've seen in my limited time is if you don't have a database of accurate registration information, then you can't control anything actually. So it's I mean it's an issue of balance in my opinion because I as again, I'm not an expert in data privacy, but I can't really see a solution where there is no database of registration information. I can see one with exceptional, let's say, safeguards and protections of data, but without one, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's my limited education. I don't know. But yeah, and in terms of solidarity, if you actually didn't mention Greece, and Dublin, I would basically say that in relation to Turkey, agreeing with the statement, and which I mean, I can't really explain why Turkey, I mean, fully agreed with it and was a part of that statement with its content back then. But yes, yeah, as, as both Nesha mentioned and Nur mentioned, I mean, this is in terms of solidarity and what Turkey expects or what we think Turkey expects. Again, I can't, I can't really say a single thing, but financial solidarity, is it important? Yeah, it's of course important. And in my opinion, this freight mechanism, uh, and I'm not saying that it's not beneficial, but a year, a billion euros a year is quite insignificant considering the whole costs. But of course, it's, it's, I mean, if you give 20 million, 20 billion a year, would it solve everything? No, I mean, the problems that we can solve by throwing money at it are the easiest problems usually. Uh, but in terms of solidarity, again, I don't have anything really new to say, but maybe we can imagine if Turkey was between the EU and Ukraine, then what kind of solidarity would it actually receive from the EU? And would it be the same? in the current case, with the current case. So, yeah, as a full for thought. Thank you, Yid. Um, is any of the, uh, our discussants, Neshe, Kizam, uh, and the speaker, Hilat, uh, would you like to answer uh, the one of the questions? 
Uh, uh, Hojam, if you have a little bit of time, I would like to comment on and maybe add on the solidarity question. Uh, go on, Nishan. We are, we are here. Very, very shortly, I would like to underline that uh, it's quite important that when we talk about solidarity, it is also at different stages following the arrival of these persons in the country. So over the years, when what we see is that we talk about rights, inclusion of persons into the schemes, and then the service delivery of a host country, which creates and which stretches the resources. So at the reception stage, solidarity may be also taking the shape of providing some support, material support to the states receiving them in order to elevate this pressure. It can be the solidarity is at the end of the process, which is related to the durable solutions. Because what the state can offer, depending on the Turkish status, as we have the geographical limitation, will be very much limited. So resettlement is one option, but complementary pathways, facilitating the family unification, facilitating the issues of labor visas, uh, student visas, will be the part of the solidarity that the states can show. But also another aspect of solidarity is also applying and reflecting and actually implementing the by the state their own international obligations that they preach to the other states or the, to the neighboring states. Meaning that if you ask for a neighboring state to open your borders and then admit these persons seeking international protection into your territory, it needs to be remembered that this is also a kind of responsibility on your side. So the states look at the others and the others implementation. So it is as part of the solidarity that each state really fulfills its own responsibilities, obligations under the international law. You prevent pushbacks, you open your territory, you allow these people to have their access to the services and the rights. This is also the part of the solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan. I think <laughs> that's uh, that's also. Although in moderator, I, I shouldn't really voice my opinions. This is uh, the floor is yours. I think I, I certainly agree with what you yeah. have said. Uh, so, Gizam, do you have any comments? No, uh, Mr. Flat probably doesn't have it. Well, okay then. Oh, uh, no, Gizam said no. She. Oh, Gizam, do you have any comments? No. Oh, okay. Uh, Sergio has an additional question for you. But Sergio, yeah, we are all right. <laughs> no, I really like uh, your presentation. Thank you so much. And I was wondering when you mentioned the importance of focusing on human rights in training, because we heard a lot from the IOM colleagues on a lot of activities on training and migration management. But why, you know, how would you take that human rights angle to training in order to stick critically? um have a stance that does not legitimize migration management uh, i apologize but i really couldn't hear hear well um the question i understood that it relates to human rights uh based trainings but the last part i couldn't catch i'm so sorry can you hear me uh yes maybe yes. yeah please go on yes it's indeed it was about human rights training and I was wondering how do you how would you implement it in a way, as you were mentioning, that the training does not legitimize migration management and still you train human rights, but not kind of side to still migration management. Yeah. Is in policies that actually run counter to human rights. Well, I understand it is a legitimate concern, but I do not think, I personally do not think um one action from the from the side of, of the international community really legitimizes the entire set of actions operations of, of, of any other any agency that is outside of, of the um, of, of the international organization we do and I'm not only referring to as I know uh, like the NGOs that are, that are working on this for like ages so much work uh, devoted into this the UNHCR and other other UN, UN agencies uh, and the Council of Europe itself um, I mean um, you, we do uh, I think to uphold the law practically uh, and also we do a lot to change the perspective the conduct the, the you know the tackle those biases uh, of, of individuals frontliners or policymakers 
but at, at the end of the day, um, uh, we cannot control any, uh, everything, unfortunately. One thing perhaps could be could be important, um, and that that um, in 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 the context of these trainings. Uh, is is the importance of monitoring your training and then uh, and then perhaps readjusting how you plan uh, these trainings uh, uh, in in um, based on on the outcome of this this monitoring uh, of, of 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 your of your work. It is at times it is at times a bit neglected, uh, as we sometimes neglect needs assessment. We also neglect uh, the monitoring of our work, the impact that we the, that we created. Perhaps your question may be relevant at that time. If there are, uh, there may be, there may be adjustments uh, of uh, on our edu um, operations. If there are certain uh, like serious discrepancies uh, between uh, between our values and 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 and, and acts uh, of, of of relevant actors. Uh, but but however, you uh, as as I am now working for an international organization, it is always important to uh, remember that our work never ends. We cannot simply cannot uh, give up. Uh, working with and working uh, working with uh, with uh, domestic authorities, uh, working with the authorities, uh, because we want to serve for the uh, uh, with the end cause uh, for us is, is is really important. I hope I was able to answer your question. I'm not super sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just nodded, <laughs> so I, I accepted as a yes. So Concluding this panel, I wish to thank all our speakers and discussants. Your contributions have been very, very valuable. See you in the next conference. Bye. I'm ending the panel now. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, so thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for joining us. I think uh, it has been marvelous today. It was always have been.